All right, Chair Gordon. Great, thank you. Thank you, Drew. And welcome to the Monday, July 12th meeting of the Sonoma County Transportation Authority and the Regional Climate Protection Authority. And so let's begin the meeting and call the meeting to order. Drew, can you uh, have a roll call, please? Yeah, so good afternoon, directors. I'll be taking roll. Uh, Director Madeline Agramonti, I do not see. Director Melanie Bagby. Present. Director Delinda Fisher. Here. Director Gerard Judice. Here. Director Sarah Gurney. Here. Uh, Director Linda Hopkins is absent. Director Ariel Kelly. Here. Director Mark Landman. Here. Oops. Director Esler Lemus. Oh, I see her on the call. <laughs> Director David Rabbit. Here. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Chris uh, Rogers. Here. And Chair Susan Gorin. Here, present, thank you. Uh, thanks, Drew. Now let's go to public comment on items not on the regular agenda. And for those of you who wrote to us, we did receive five or six letters from you. And I'm sure we re read what you had to say, but Drew, go ahead and ask for public comments. Yeah, certainly uh, members of the public, if you wish to speak on items not on the agenda, please raise your hand now. Uh, Chair Gorn, I do not see any hands raised at this moment. Great. Thank you to those members of the community who wrote to us in advance of the meeting. We appreciate it. Okay, so let's move on to the consent calendar. And we have a number of items on our consent calendar this afternoon. Uh, for concurrent items, SCTA, RCPA, administration, the meeting not notes from June 14th. And uh, for SETA items, 3.2 is a ride sharing program agreement, 3.3 is a cooperative agreement amendment and appropriation request for the Petaluma River Trail. Glad to see that moving forward. And let me flip the page, hold on a minute. And item 3.4 is a mitigation fee cooperative agreement with the County of Sonoma, Pengrove Main Street uh, project. And those are the items on our consent calendar. Uh, do we have any board questions or comments on those consent items? And I'm seeing no one raise hands. So Drew, do we have any public comment on those consent items? Um, I do not see any hands raised, nor did I receive any pre-submitted public comments on the consent calendar. Great, thank you. I think, uh, how about a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar? I'll move the uh, consent calendar items 3.1 through 3.4. And Director Fisher will second. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll need a roll call vote on that, Drew. Absolutely. Uh, Director Bagby? Aye. Director Fisher? Yes. Director Judice? Yes. Director Gurney? Yes. Director Kelly? Yes. Director Landman? Yes. Director Lemus? Yes. Director uh, Rabbit? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Rogers? Aye. And Chair Gorin? Aye. Thank you so much. Let's move on to our regular calendar on the SETA items, item 4.1, planning, presentation of the draft comprehensive transportation plan. And Suzanne, I, I bet you're going to turn this over to someone else, but why don't you introduce <laughs> the item? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am pleased to uh, hand this item off to the lead coordinator for it, Janet Spillman, and the planning team. Uh, Janet, I believe Janet, Chris, and Dana will provide the presentation on the update to our comprehensive transportation plan. Excited uh, to have this document before you today after a couple of years of process and development to get it into shape. And so I will turn it over to Janet to lead off. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm pleased to present today the draft comprehensive transportation plan moving forward 2050. This is an information item for discussion and feedback. 
We will be bringing this back to you in September for approval. So action is not required today. While the CTP in many ways looks different from the last plan, it is substantively an update. As it turns out, many of our transportation needs are the same today as they were in September 2016 when the last CTP was adopted. We need more transportation options and we need to be, them to be implemented in ways that are thoughtful of the community's needs and attuned to sustainability. Changes in this plan include an update of the visions, vision and goals and increased public engagement with the community-based organizations to better connect with historically underserved members of the community. Next slide, please. Thank you, Drew. The importance of maintaining an updated planning document is twofold. First, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC, requires local transportation authorities like SETA to establish a transportation plans that can feed into the larger regional transportation plan. The RTP is a federally required long range planning document that is called Plan, plan Bay Area. Second, the SETA is responsible for programming or allocating numerous state and federal funding resources to transportation projects. In order to meet those requirements, the SETA needs a policy and planning document to help guide the programming process. If SETA does not meet these two requirements, it is at risk of losing critical transportation dollars. Next. The CTP process began in 2019 and followed the process shown on this slide. We started with public engagement strategy and updated the vision and goals of the plan. We worked with our partners on inventorying the system and reviewing trends. We also updated the list of projects and tested their performance against the goals. Each step was reviewed by the advisory committees and there were several steps where the board took action, such as approving the goals in March, 2020. Next, please. Kickoff for, uh, for the CTP was spring 2019, which launched public outreach that has been almost continuous in one form or another since then. A call for projects was released in June, 2019. And in late 2019, we began a five month process that culminated in an update of update vision and set of goals. That was approved March 9th, which was also the last time we saw each other in person. Activities went virtual then and work continued on current conditions, forecasts, technical analysis, including performance analysis of the project list. Writing it, the, the plan itself has been the focus of attention this year. This presentation is to release the draft document we will be taking comments on the document until August 16th and bring it back to you. I mean, I'm sorry, August 13th and bring it back to you on September 13th. Next. Chapter one lays out who we are, why we plan and what our priorities are. This is a photo from early outreach at Community Action Partnership in Sonoma, of Sonoma. Next. The SETA has a comprehensive transportation, has had a CTP since 2001. The initial plan laid out priority projects and policies, many of which have been successfully implemented along, including mega projects like the carpool lane on 101 and passenger rail service. Although some of the outstanding issues remain like potholes and the need for more bikeways and transit, the plan serves as an important role in establishing how we need to address transportation needs and in guiding funding decisions to address those needs. Next. Equity is a priority. As a transportation agency, we rely on demographic information, including poverty levels, to define geographic locations that can be prioritized for transportation projects. The communities of concern, now known as Equity Priority Communities, EPCs, along with Caltrans's disadvantaged communities are useful tools to bring attention to underserved communities. Communities in need may not live in concentrated neighborhoods, especially in Sonoma County, where economically disadvantaged people are dispersed throughout the suburban and rural parts of the county. Addressing the whole population of disadvantaged people 
with means-based fares and other policies, along with more robust outreach, are steps towards equity. Next. Public engagement began in person with meetings with CBOs and at libraries, then morphed into virtual engagement, including a series of webinars. You can see the webinars on the CTP webpage. There will be another webinar after this presentation next Tuesday, July 20th. We will receive comments until August 13th in preparation for the final CTP in September. Next. These were the top issues of phase one of the outreach. No surprises here. Time congestion on the road and uh, time taken on the bus were the top priorities among the CBOs. Next. These slides from Gosinoma Poly reflect many of our findings from the outreach overall. Topping the list of concerns are potholes, GHG emissions, congestion, safety, and access. Next. A continuation of the Gosinoma polling shows that shows um, issues that are the lower priorities. Next. In late 2019, the board reviewed performance of the plan and progress made on goals overall. After a series of workshops, the board approved the vision and goals. They are, the vision is connecting the people, places, and goods as we transition our transportation network to zero emissions by 2050. Our guiding principles are to improve safety, equity, and quality of life. The goals are connected to be connected and reliable, safe and well-maintained, community-oriented and place-based, and zero emissions by 2050. Next. I'm sorry, I've got to go to next. All right, here's an overview of the transportation project types included in the CTP. The CTP is not a constrained plan, but the reality of delivering projects is limited by funding Greater project analysis and opportunity for decision-making will happen as funds are programmed. This list is not exclusive. If a spectacular project emerges out of the blue with a set source of funding next year after the CTP is approved, we can include it. That said, funding is a huge challenge. The call for projects was released in June 2019, and we're due in September later that same year. We've been working with staff and taking comments for two years. And here's what we, where we are with 10 billion plus dollars in projects. As you can see in the summary in the slide, we have a total known funding of one, about $1.5 billion over that same time period. Maintenance is a considerable proportion of the roadway improvements and there are twice as many bike and ped projects as in the last plan. Several significant project types, multimodal straight, streetscape improvements, new tech, and TDM are new. The big takeaway is that transit accounts for more than half the project costs. The project list, which with details, is online at the CTP website. Next. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Barney for this chapter. Great, thanks Janet and good afternoon everyone. So uh, every time we update the CTP, uh, we take a chance to look at the transportation system and population in the county as it is now and how we expect it to change over time. So currently there are about half a million people living in Sonoma County and we expect that to increase by five to up to 20% by 2050. Uh, so the graphs on this slide show that number one, we're expecting the population to continue to age in the county uh, with the working age population dropping below 50% of the total and seniors making up almost a third of the population by 2050. Uh, we also expect the county to become more ethnically diverse by 2050. Um, and so we, we keep an eye on these things because the changing population um, you know, as people age and as the population changes, there are different transportation needs and um, we like to anticipate those going forward. Next slide, please. 
The future is always uncertain, but we it's important to try and anticipate how the county will change and grow over time so we can address the needs of the changing population. Uh, this slide compares current population, which is shown in the royal blue on the far left of each of these bars for current population, occupied housing units, and employment. Uh, so there are a number of different ways of forecasting the future. Uh, I've pulled some of those out and summarized those on these this graph. Uh, so the bar to the right of the current population, the 2019 population housing units and employment is representing the current development pipeline, uh, which are short term projects that are somewhere in the development process and could be developed anytime in the next six months to 10 years. So this is looking at short term uh, potential growth. Uh, the next set of bars in green is showing uh, the general plan build out or the potential growth that could occur if all local plans were maximized and built out. And then finally, on the far right, uh, I've included forecasts from Plan Bay Area 2050 for population, housing units, and employment. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of this CTP update, and with your support and the help of local staff, we were able to compile the Sonoma County Travel Behavior Study, uh, which really provides a wealth of information on how Sonoma County residents and visitors to the county uh, travel uh, throughout the county and to surrounding areas. Uh, so there are a number of um, big things that we learned as we collected this information and compiled the report, but one of which is that almost 90% of trips starting and ending in the county uh, stay in the county each day, and only about 9% enter or leave, uh, with a small proportion, proportion passing all the way through the county each day. Uh, next slide, please. So another uh, important factor that we saw as we examined this data was that 60% of daily trips are shorter than five miles. Uh, and actually just about 30% are under two miles. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities here to shift these uh, shorter trips uh, to other uh, non-motorized travel modes. Uh, we also saw that um, when you look at trips crossing the county line, they only account for about 10% of the total trips each day. Uh, but since they're long distance trips generally crossing the county line, uh, they make up a higher proportion of total VMT or vehicle miles traveled each day. And this is because they're longer trips. Uh, we also saw that uh, a good portion of these trips are occurring in the Highway 101 corridor. And so there's potential to shift those onto uh, other transportation facilities as well, like rail, uh, express bus, and get more people into carpools. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so looking at information from the travel behavior study and other current data sources, uh, we've been able to identify a number of transportation related opportunities and also challenges. Uh, so I also mentioned the number of short trips that we're seeing in the county, those trips under five miles. And like I said before, there are a lot of opportunities to shift those into onto biking and walking and other emerging transportation modes. Uh, we saw that 90% of the trips stay in the county. So most of Sonoma County workers and travelers stay in the county. So we need to continue to encourage job growth and other uh, development of destinations near where people live in the county. Uh, and that's been a priority here um, over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, we know that the county um, planning departments and, and agencies are focused on city-centered growth. So this will help us improve safety and access and make it easier to walk, bike, or take transit. Uh, and we also saw in the last year during the pandemic uh, that telecommuting and avoiding trips altogether has potential to actually reduce total travel and BMT, uh, or at the very least to shift travel to less congested time periods. So we also saw a number of challenges that we're still facing. Um, one, over the last uh, five to 10 years, we've seen how emergencies can really impact travel conditions and patterns, both during the actual events uh, and also um, after these emergency events uh, due to displacement and uh, changing landscapes. Uh, we've seen that travel is still focused on the single occupant vehicle. And um, even though most of the travel and trips stay in the county, 
we do have quite a number of long trips entering and exiting the county each day that still contribute a lot of VMT and total mileage and travel uh, to the transportation system. Uh, so next slide, please. So at this point, I think I'm going to hand things over to Dana Ture. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, directors. Chapter three lays out the current transportation system in Sonoma County, discusses the transportation projects that were submitted for the CTP, and the vision, trends, and innovation by mode. This chapter covers roads and highways, the bicycle and pedestrian system, the transit system, and programs that support non-single occupancy auto modes. Next. There are over 2,600 2, miles of public roadway in Sonoma County, which is far greater than other counties in the region, including those with a much higher population. Over half the roadway mileage is in the unincorporated county. The estimated cost to maintain the state of repair on our roads is $3 billion over the next three years. These roads see over 1.6 million trips on an average weekday. And as Chris mentioned, 89% of the trips are within the county. Listed here are the top trip generators within Sonoma County. Next slide. The CTP road and highway projects include improvements to highway interchanges, intersections, intelligent transportation systems, and new technologies, multimodal streetscape improvements, roadway improvements, and maintenance, including bridge replacements. The estimated cost for these projects through 2050 total $4 billion, $4 billion and $36 million. Uh, next slide, please. Intelligent transportation systems are constantly evolving and can improve safety and efficiency. The wide rollout of autonomous vehicles has not come as quickly as we may have earlier thought, but still must be carefully planned to avoid for potential negative impacts, including increased vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. The next section is on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Although only 8% of trips in Sonoma County are being taken by bicycle or walking, we, what we found in the travel behavior study shows good potential to shift some of these trips to these modes. There are approximately 208 miles of bikeways on the ground right now, and over 1,000 more that are planned. A majority of the planned projects are on road class two bicycle lanes. Next slide. There are 111 bicycle and pedestrian projects in the plan, which include projects over $1 million and one project per jurisdiction that combines all of the other projects under $1 million uh, in that jurisdiction. So implementation of all 111 bicycle and pedestrian projects, including the 1,000 miles of bicycle lanes, is estimated to cost $860 million. Some of the larger projects are the countywide expansion of micromobility, uh, completion of the smart pathway, the North San Rosa station area bike pet connector over Highway 101, the South we Southeast Greenway uh, multi-use path and crossings in Santa Rosa, class two bike lanes on Highway 1, and class two bike lanes on Highway 128. Next slide. So 2020 was a big year for biking and walking with COVID-19 restrictions, closed gyms and changed and limited routines. Many people spent more time outdoors taking walks and riding bikes across the county, sorry, across the country, um, bicycling increased an estimated 20% and one in 10 American adults rode a bike for the first time in a year. Bicycle sales increased roughly 65% and electric bicycle sales increased by 145%. The slow street movement picked up as there was more demand for space to walk while physical distancing and for open air dining. 
And some jurisdictions have taken steps to make some of these temporary changes permanent as they have become popular. Next slide. The public transit system in Sonoma County includes services from six agencies and covers the wide stretches of our geography with more concentrated services where population is more concentrated. In 2019, there were over 4.4 million rides on public transit in Sonoma County. A large portion of transit riders in Sonoma County are lower income and a large percentage of riders do not have access to a vehicle. High school and college students also make up a significant portion of transit riders. Next slide. So here's a sampling of the kind of transit projects submitted for the CTP. These total over $5 billion. Uh, transit improvements that are non-capital include operating costs for service and service enhancement, first and last mile operations, fare-free programs, paratransit operations, and more. Transit capital projects include new buses, bus stops and shelters, smart extension to Cloverdale, facilities and maintenance. Um, ITS and new technologies includes projects like traffic signal technology, fair payment technology, and marketing. Next slide. So trends and innovation in transit include microtransit with dynamic trip routing and on-demand service, improved technologies for trip planning and fares, transit priority projects that allow transit to bypass traffic congestion. And of course, there's a future potential for automation of transit vehicles. Next slide. Mode shift programs offered, often referred to as transportation demand management or TDM are a collection of methods and actions intended to improve the efficiency of the existing transportation system by reducing the demand for single occupancy vehicle travel, especially during peak commute times. Under this category of projects, we have Green Trip Sonoma County, which would customize and pilot the use of one or more Green Trip tools in Sonoma County, and a Transportation uh, Management Association, which would provide a variety of transportation demand management services to individuals and groups of employers and institutions. Next. So here are some of the mode shift programs that are underway now and are discussed in the plan. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Chris to uh, talk about chapter four. Yeah, so next slide, Drew. Thanks, Dana. Um, and good to see everyone again. Um, so chapter four really digs into plan performance and discusses how we can reach the plan goals. Uh, so this was a three part process, um, the CTP evaluation as for this comprehensive transportation plan. So first we summarized existing conditions and looked at future conditions without the plan. Uh, next, we plugged projects into the travel model and other tools and evaluated the impacts and, and um, associated uh, conditions in the future if those projects would be constructed. And then finally, we evaluated how non-project factors like different policies, technologies, and behavioral changes could provide potential benefits or change travel conditions in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So when evaluating performance, it's important to have a measuring stick that you can look at. So we use performance measures to evaluate the plan and how uh, different projects and policies and actions uh, can help us reach the plan goals and objectives. So we've updated all of the plan goals, uh, which Janet uh, introduced earlier in this presentation. And so based on that, re we reevaluated the performance measures we've used in the past, um, removed some of them that were no longer relevant, and added a few more. And as we were doing that and evaluating them, we found that many of them relate to multiple goals. Uh, so this chart lists out the performance measures and how they relate to each of these goals. So uh, on the top of this chart, you can see the different plan goals, connected and reliable, self and well-maintained, community-oriented and place-based, and zero emissions. And then the different performance measures um, on the, the Y axis, axis of the graph. So you can see a number of these performance measures are associated with different goals. 
Uh, next slide, please. As part of the performance evaluation, we found that the plan provides improved transit service coverage and ridership. Uh, it also expands the bicycle and pedestrian system and connections. And as Dana introduced earlier, uh, the plan would add uh, over 800 miles of additional bicycle pedestrian facilities. Uh, it would provide better access to employment and destinations. Uh, it would lower household travel costs, largely because um, if all the projects were developed and the policies were implemented, uh, household travel um, distances would go down um, a small amount. Uh, and then finally, the plan would lower uh, VMT and greenhouse gases on a per person or per capita basis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So many of the projects in the plan are really focused on improving local conditions. So the modeling tools we have um, aren't really able to accurately capture the local project benefits, um, such as local safety improvements, ADA improvements, increased neighborhood mobility and connectivity, and other really small scale benefits. So it's important to point those out that a number of the projects on the project list are really focused on these sort of things that aren't easily uh, measured as part of the performance assessment. Next slide, please. So as we are measuring performance and evaluating the performance measures, we also uh, found the following challenges. Uh, there's a continue, continued reliance on automobiles in the future. Um, Congestion and delay would continue to be problems, especially during the peak travel periods. Uh, many of the projects on the CTP project list are unfunded, and uh, there are a lot of um, maintenance funding shortfalls as well. So additional funding will be required to implement uh, many of these projects and continue to maintain the system. Um, and then using the tools that we have available, we saw no reduction in, in collision rates. Although there are a number of projects underway currently that are um, focused specifically on improving safety, like the Countywide Vision Zero project. Next slide, please. Uh, so one thing that we did as part of the last comprehensive transportation plan, and which we uh, did as part of this plan as well, is looked at how can we achieve the CTP vision and goals and what types of actions are really important to focus on as we work to do that. Uh, so we've included a graphic here that summarizes some of these actions. I'm not gonna go through each of them specifically, but just pick out a few. You know, we'd really need to make equity a part of every decision-making process uh, as we evaluate transportation changes. Uh, we need to shift people out of automobiles into other modes like biking, uh, walking, and taking transit. Uh, we need to improve our vehicle fleet economy. Uh, we evaluated increasing that to 55 miles per gallon or better at the fleet level. Uh, and then finally, we need to implement safety policies like Vision Zero uh, safety policies. Uh, at this point, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Janet to wrap things up. I'm going to leave it on this slide for a second. Uh, they achieve the visions and goals, please. Thank you. And, and how do we do this? There are so many of these things that we need to do uh, that are beyond our, our ability um, or our funding levels currently. So we need to look for partnerships, uh, additional funding sources. We need to advocate for supportive policy making at all levels of government. We need to encourage behavior change wherever and however we can. And as Chris mentioned, we need to make equity a part of every decision-making process. So it can be done with some work. So now we get to the hard part. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to make the point clearly, we have an unconstrained project list. Um, we have an $86 billion shortfall over 25 years, 2.1 billion in road maintenance alone, 1.6 for transit needs. Thankfully, we have over $800 million in local funds to leverage outside fund sources to deliver projects. Let's get off this slide, please, next. All right, we've taken this presentation to all of the advisory committees. And on July 20th, as I mentioned earlier, there'll be uh, a webinar with this presentation. We will take comments until August 13th and bring the final plan 
back to this board for approval in September. Next. All right, now's your turn for questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet and Chris and Dana. Fabulous information. And I was just going through the draft report, almost 200 pages, very colorful, very easy to read and a lot of great information. And I hope uh, the board really dives into this document. It's, it, it shows how much time you put into preparing it. So the question that I have, and then I'll open it up to the board, Janet, you talked about community outreach and the, the need for uh, overlaying equity on everything that we do. And how are we specifically going to outreach uh, to our very diverse community to solicit their feedback on the draft plan? Because as you noted, uh, in one of the pieces of information, over 70% uh, or our public transit is used by 70% low income individuals. So we wanna make sure that we include their voices in, in the report and in the action items going forward. So how are we going to do this? Yeah, so they, um, we, the very first part of our uh, engagement plan was to meet with community-based organizations. We had uh, over a dozen meetings with them. Uh, and so we plan to, and they provided a whole lot of input. We uh, met with them individually. And then later on, once we'd assembled um, our findings, we went back to them to, you know, for a reality check, is this really how you consider, what you consider your primary needs? And then uh, now that we have a draft, we're, we're reconnecting with them to see, you know, to look for their input further. Okay, great. I think uh, government is really challenged to provide authentic outreach, especially during COVID. So we rely on Zooms and accessing information and outreach through organizations. So it, it is difficult. I know we're going to do our best, but uh, we had comments from uh, Anna Lugo and her consulting uh, firm on one of our efforts. And so I would want us to make sure that we connect with her and all of the various uh, organizations that she's involved with, certainly. Uh, so great job. Thank you all so much. Good information. So let's open up to the board. This is a report item uh, and it's coming back to the board in September for action. I see a hand raised by the Linda Fisher. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so we know from our uh, Sonoma Climate Mobil Mobilization Strategy that 60% of our GHG emissions come from our transportation system. And I'm wondering with the, with the implementation of this plan, what do you see in 2050 as being our percentage of emissions coming from transportation? Do you have that? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. So one of the things that we've done as part of the last two CDPs is looked at the um, climate action plan uh, target <laughs> reduction. Um, and so as part of that work, we looked at actually meeting um, that target. Um, so if you review the actual plan, um, we'd be able to hit those targets by uh, implementing the projects and policies um, included in um, that matrix that we put up uh, at the end of the presentation. So there's more information, quantifiable information on that uh, in this plan and the previous plan, uh, but it includes pretty, um, you know, it includes many things that we'd have to stretch to do, uh, like improving the vehicle fuel economy to 55 five miles per gallon, uh, completely filling the high occupancy toll lanes um, during the peak periods, completely filling our buses and trains, um, shifting <laughs> um, about seven or eight percent of total travel to walk and bike, um, things like that. So there's a long list of actions that uh, we evaluated to see how we could actually meet that climate action um, plan goal. So uh, there is an evaluation. I don't, um, you know, and the goal would be to hit that by, I believe it was 2035. We actually didn't 
uh, project that out to 2050. But if we would continue those actions, it would, you know, we'd be, be able to continue to make progress on that. Okay, I, I didn't read the 2016 plan, but I did read this plan in totality. Um, and I was struck by the table 2.3 and table 2.7 that looks at our 2015, what happened there, whether people are driving alone, whether they're using transit, et cetera. And in 2050, you're anticipating that we essentially have the very same numbers so that we're not actually moving people from single, single occupancy vehicles to other modes of transit in using this plan or as a result of this plan. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, that's considering the projects only. You know, you'd have to, we'd have to implement other policies and education to, to get people to do that, to shift that. That needle's very difficult to move. Um, so we have looked at things like pricing in the past and, um, you know, that has shown to move that, but there are uh, associated problems with that. Um, we looked at tripling the amount of transit service and providing free transit as well, and that shifts things as, as well. But um, it's very difficult, uh, at least using the tools that we have available to us right now and just implementing projects to uh, get people to shift modes. I'd like to point out that what Chris tested was the CTP project list. That's, that's what we have available to us to, uh, to improve performance. Um, and so that last um, multicolored chart or additional things that need to be done um, that we require partnerships or additional funding in order to meet our goals. But they're not really a part of this plan I, as I understand it. Well, uh, this is a transportation plan. There's a lot of behavior change and housing policies and um, state and federal policies that need to change that are beyond our scope. Well, uh, but, I, but I would add that the, that matrix, the, the chart there at the end of the presentation, that is part of the plan. Whether we have the authority as SETA to implement it is another question, but we, we are saying these are the, the policy actions that need to occur in order to achieve the goals that we lay out in the plan we can't do it all. We, we don't necessarily have all of the authorities uh, to, to do that. Um, can I just offer from my perspective that given that that's like one slide on the entire 200 page of the plan that we can flesh that out and, and make that a little bit more clear about what communities can do perhaps. Thank you. Thanks, Delinda. Ariel Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, the cost decrease per household. I think it was on slide 35, and just trying to get a better sense. You know, I'm I'm just thinking about if we're if we're talking about the majority of our transit riders are low income, and cost plays a huge factor in in behavior change. What does that shift really look like from a dollars and cents perspective? And should we be contemplating, I know you just mentioned this in, in response to, to Delinda's question, um, what, should we be thinking about cost and cost reduction as a greater mechanism to, to sh behavior shift? I just, I'm looking at that, that non-auto mode of transit staying flat. Um, and that to me is like the critical piece that's not shifting that we need to shift. And so I'm looking at cost as that factor. Can you guys talk a little bit more about the intersection of those two, two issues? The issue of pricing, um, well, first off, it's, it's known to work to decrease VMT. Um, pricing and parking, pricing and, and, and uh, VMT, um, but it's also, concerned, we're concerned about equity issues in pricing and the need to make them um, equitable to all users, especially low-income users. So um, yes, charging more for anything will make it more, um, will improve our costs quite a bit. I guess I'm also looking at the, the household spending on transportation. 
uh, as well. So not just from like the cost fluctuation, but also just in, you know, we think about housing and how the burden of the housing costs, right? How much people are paying in their total income towards rent. And so I guess I'm curious about just overall transportation costs in the different modes of transportation, whether it's single occupancy vehicles versus bus ridership, like if if we should be looking more holistically at when someone has you know net take home pay, how much are they using towards transportation, and how if we're talking about low income residents, how can we help that money stretch further? Oh, I see. To better um, you know get get folks on the right mode of transit that's going to improve our overall solution. Um, and then are, are people heavily burdened by the transportation costs in our current system? And should we be thinking about that as our county starts to, when looking at the demographics, we're skewing older and more retired and skewing our working population is younger, more low income, more ethnically diverse. Right. I'm sorry, I misinterpreted your question. No, that's okay. It's it's kind of a both thing, right? It's, right. it's how do we use that, the cost of ridership to incentivize the behavior we want to see, but then also the household burden. Well, uh, part of the um, toolbox is in means-based fares um, and other kind of means-based policies um, that we have not yet implemented here, but that probably will be with some of the transit agencies. Have I believe we smart... Sorry, say that one more time. I believe SMART has means-based fares as well. And we are utilizing the Clipper Start program as yeah. well. Is that still kind of being piloted or where are we at in? That is actually available on uh, with all of the transit agencies in Sonoma County. Uh, it's a 20% discount on the bus agencies and 50%, sorry, 50% on SMART and Golden Gate. And how's the utilization of it? Um, I haven't heard too much. I think that the data is a little tricky to um, find because it's uh, people sign up for it through Clipper. Um, I think it's been a, a slow roll, but has slowly been increasing. Okay. And then is there a, a like an, an intersection point between this uh, cost and the burden on household income for transportation and then also what we can be doing to try to shift non increase the the non auto utilization i mean the seeing that that's going to be flat is to me feels like we aren't being successful sorry i don't have a really good answer for you on that um the cost of transportation is something that we haven't analyzed in very much depth well, and I, I think the the policy issues around incentivizing certain behaviors and making part of the the message and context for that uh, related to cost, right? So here's what it costs for you to live and work in Sonoma County, and if you take this mode of transportation, you have this sort of benefit and savings. Um, Maybe you have some savings in time, but you also have some savings in cost. And, and looking at that sort of, uh, I think, intersectionality and, and um, analysis is not something we've done in this plan, but I think it's an interesting policy discussion as we move forward about how you, how you convince people um, that alternative modes to just them owning a car, vehicle ownership and driving everywhere isn't in their financial best interest and, and what, the, what a good argument is and a good case to, to be made for that, for, for switching modes. Um, and, and what are some financial incentives we could provide that would encourage people to do that? Um, I, you know, other than Clipper Start right now, I think you know, the, the fare free service that's provided uh, in some of our uh, smaller jurisdictions by Sonoma County Transit is an interesting way to look at it. You know, trying to get students on board with transit at dis, you know, severely discounted or free uh, is a good way to, to modify behavior that will have, you know, have long-term benefits. Uh, so those are the sorts of, of policies that, you know, we, we touch on a little bit in the plan, maybe indirectly to, to the manner in which you were framing it, but I, I do think those are, um, those are those are good points and worthy of sort of further analysis in terms of developing policy. 
And I think- Thanks, Suzanne and, and Ariel and Delinda. Um, we, we have a, um, a longish agenda and a hard stop at about 420. So I don't wanna rush this conversation, but I do wanna comment and say, this is the hardest, most important conversation and policy direction that we have in our lifetimes with 60% with of our emissions coming from transportation, how do we move that shift? Uh, is it through pricing availability? I'm not sure. I don't wanna hurry the conversation forward other than we're time limited, but this is probably the nuts and bolts of our challenges ahead of us for the next five to 10 years. So Ariel, uh, last comments, questions? Happy to move on. I was unaware of the hard stop. So thank you. I think as was Suzanne. <laughs> and, and, and so absolutely right. And so we will, uh, we're going to revisit this probably every meeting and the answering, attempting to answer the core questions that you both raised. Uh, Melanie, you had a comment question? Uh, yes, I have a question, and just kind of to uh, to briefly follow up on um, uh, what Ariel was asking. You know, I, I'm I'm somebody who has given up a second car um, multiple times because we knew we could depend on transit. When when my, I lived in Sausalito, we took the ferry in and we did the math. We figured out it's very simple. You can go to the AAA website and you can find out how much your car costs you, and it's not about you know gas, and it's not about um, how much the, you know, the monthly payment is. It's about how much it really costs a family to have a second or third or fourth car. And um, that's the low hanging fruit really is being so dependable that you can say, well, you know, we're going is to, is that are those families or those couples or those retirees who many of whom I know have already done that they're, they decided to, they, they, you know, they're not both working anymore. They've decided to consult, consolidate their costs. They go down in one car. That's really low hanging fruit for us. So I think that we should really agendize that looking at that in a future meeting. And I think part of the challenge is so much of that is tied into our land use and our housing policy. And it's not all, under the jurisdiction here, but it's such an important part of the conversation. So I'd like to see us, um, you know, uh, find, find a, a, a direction to move in where we can, um, because the answer is dependable public transportation. That's how you incentivize people to get out of the car, which takes me to my actual, my point. And I really want to thank Chris for teasing out, you know, my, um, my main concern and that you, you illustrate, you illustrated so well, that you know, our our big challenge. One of our big challenges is the longer trips, and they're happening within Sonoma County. So we need to really look at where our transportation dollars are being invested. Are we keeping them here in the county? Um, but also look at the fact that you know we still, um, after several, uh, after a couple of meetings, you know, Smart to Healdsburg and Smart to Cloverdale are still left off of the regional transportation plan, which means that we cannot compete for. Um, like the two million additional dollars that the state is committing <laughs> to transit for what are our longest trips, which we've already just acknowledged in our plan, is our big, you know, one of our biggest challenges. So, you know, we as an agency need to find a way to make sure that Smart can compete for those regional transportation dollars. So, I just really want to thank um, Chris for for underlining uh, underlining that. Um, and we have to also look at where we're directing our policies locally so that we can take advantage of those state dollars. The state of California is focusing on transportation as a means to address climate change, which means that there are going to be dollars available for us, which means that our policies and our, our regional transportation plan needs to be in line for that so that we can compete for those dollars. Because again, We've just seen a study, our biggest greenhouse gas emitters are our cars, and the biggest chunk of that are our long commutes. The way that you address that is you have a complete transportation system that is based on rail, because rail is what can create the demand and can create the, um, you know, the, the impetus to get downtown development, which we're all committed to. It is the thing that can actually, it's just like, you know, rail and ferries. People want to take them. That's what changes people's behavior. That's what attracts the kind of city center development that all of us need. That 
you know, making sure that we have implemented rail means we're addressing our longest trips, our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's just kind of like, we need to make sure that we are setting ourselves up for success because what we're doing here is we're helping people with their quality of life because we want to be a great place to live and work, which means that we don't want people to be stuck on the freeway for an hour and a half in electric cars or gas powered cars. Doesn't matter. That's not the, the issue is we need to get people out of their cars and give them good options. We also need to, number one is we've got to address climate change and these policies are the best way to do it. So, um, I appreciate the report. And so I guess my, you know, my, my big, my big question is this, um, you know, since our last meeting where we had the presentation from MTC and SCT with the plan, latest plan B area, we also know that we have the bridge earmark, the rail bridge um, earmark for Healdsburg. Um, the reauthorization bill goes through as is, and if the bridge tolls end up getting freed up, how are those funds going to be added back in, and how are we going to revise this plan? So those are those are my questions for staff. So I'll take that one. Um, so SMART is in our plan, uh, and it, so that's that's this item. The next item, uh, the Plan Bay Area discussion. Uh, the the plan can be amended and uh that's that's mtc can include us in the plan or not include us in the plan but at this point they they are not it's not included and the manner in which we will get it included is via an amendment process great thank you yep great thank you all thought-provoking questions and comments sarah brief comment question this is challenging because we've touched on so many subject matters and Madam Chair, you want us to go quickly. First, a thank you to yes. staff. This is a very engaging <laughs> report, very attractive, very good looking and very readable. And I thought, what a geek I've turned into. I'm enjoying reading this. Uh, so I wanna get to this point about SMART. There is a comment about SMART and the map again does not include any reference to the outlying cities, Sonoma and Sebastopol. And I think this body needs to always emphasize some kind of link to those two outlier cities. Quit cutting us off, okay? <laughs> Speaks to Melanie's point too. I'm talking like mm -hmm. Madam Chair there, right? Or else. Okay, so <laughs> I just wanna get back to the point about climate change and this intersectionality. Suzanne, you gave us that word today. I'm gonna use that because <laughs> I read this report and go, well, this would be great if it was for 2030. Come on though, it's going to 2050. And we have this huge crisis the climate emergency, and I just don't see how this report accurately addresses that. For instance, we've just experienced the first pandemic. We could have waves and waves of this. It's long enduring as a climate emergency for us brought around the globe. We don't know its impact on travel, work, housing, right? Housing jobs balance, how that affects transportation. We just don't fully understand it yet. And we have also a long and during fire season now from conservatively June to December, but actually many of us feel like it's several more months a year where we're worrying about fire and how is that going to affect us? We need evacuation plans. I don't see that sort of topic area played very heavily on here and yet it's critically important to all of our citizens and that dire directly relates to our transportation and our maps and our ways for people to get around. Also, we have short-term emergencies that are climate related, like flooding, where downtown Sebastopol and the Laguna Bridge go underwater and we can't go anywhere. And that's like this hundred year thing that's supposed to happen a hundred years, but is happening here, you know, maybe as often as four or five years. There are quite a, there's quite a lot of climate um, experience that we all have as our responsibility under the RCPA as those directors, and it needs to intersect with this report in a way where addressing the climate issues effectively. Maybe staff can reassure me that's in this report in certain places. That's the question I'm raising. Like, I don't think it's enough. I think we need more of that intersectionality. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, comments from staff on that? I'd like to point, uh, make sure that everybody's aware that we have a fairly 
robust appendix appendices. And uh, we have um, written by our own Tanya Nareth is um, getting to vision, I mean, uh, GHG reductions by 2050, getting to uh, zero emissions by 2050. So we're hoping that that along with other previous documents like our shift plan uh, will illustrate what we can do and what we have done and what we'd like to do in the future. Well, I might suggest, Janet, that we consider not burying that in an appendix, but putting it more up front. Maybe it needs to be a chapter or a conclusion somewhere. That's just an editorial remark. No need to comment. If I could, if I could add on um, Director Gurney, your your comments about sort of evacuation planning or you know flood impacts, fire impacts. Um, you're you're right. We don't get into that, but there are hazard mitigation plans that do for each of the jurisdictions, or I think almost, I think all of them have hazard mitigation plans. So, you know, there's, there are other, uh, there are other forums where we can sort of connect with, but I don't think you want us doing evacuation planning, for example, like that is not going to be our wheelhouse with the staff on the screen right now. So, um, I, you know, we are much more reliant on the emergency services folks or the, the, the planning staff in your jurisdictions to, to provide that level. Um, if it's acknowledging that that is a thing that we are, that we as a region need to like sort of, I don't know, highlight or, or at least acknowledge, I, you know, that, that's definitely um, something we could incorporate. I just wouldn't want the expectation to be that this plan would be a source for, for evacuation planning or, or anything like that. That's clearly not what I expect, Suzanne. Yes, okay. so I, I didn't mean to burden you with that extra responsibility for all of everybody. I just see that, that we have this effort and Tanya is making this through the RCPA as well, like to collect and be regional and regional in our perspective. And I think since we all experienced the climate emergencies together and one city's impact affects another city, some of those more regional comments in some of the paragraphs. Okay, we need to go on to someone else, Madam Chair. Okay, great, thank, thank you, Sarah. I don't see any other hands raised now, but we'll have lots of opportunities to talk about the Comprehensive Transportation Plan. Uh, so uh, Drew, let's uh, ask for public comment on this. All righty, members of the public, if you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand. And we will start with Steve Bertelbau. Steve, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Members, uh, Steve Bertelbau, uh, uh, the Sierra Club uh, looked at this uh, briefly at its meeting on Monday, and uh, we did send a letter to you uh, noting that the uh, the climate action, the climate mobilization plan is talking about reaching goals of uh, uh, carbon neutrality in 2030. And uh, so we would hope that uh, the uh, the plan uh, does recognize uh, and uh, track what it can contribute by 2030. Uh, I'll leave it there because we've got some time to work on this, but uh, I look forward to working with staff and uh, making sure that uh, there is a connection between the climate model mobilization plan and uh, the transportation plan. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Next in line is Eris Weaver. Eris, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Eris with the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Um, I was pleased to see in the report that uh, matrix that um, uh, compared the strategies with the overall goals that uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure met the greatest number of goals of any of the um, projects or uh, strategies listed there. Um, however, I it's um, 
it's it's hard for me to see in this plan how the amount of Moshare that we need to have happen can happen. I would really love to see those miles of bikeway uh, separated out into the different classes because I'm sorry, I just can't I don't want to hear any more bragging about how many miles of class two bike path are made. Those aren't going to get more people on their bikes, right? We need more buffered class four or class one bike lanes than class two bike lanes to get people uh, on their car out of um, their cars and on their bikes and feel safe doing so. I also want to call out um, the the referring to congestion and traffic delays as a problem. It's not the problem. That is the direct result of a focus on individual automobiles, right? All, when we say, oh, there was too much traffic, it means I wanted to be in my car and have all those other cars not be there, not that I don't wanna be in my car. To get people to switch their behavior, we have to make the things we want them to do pleasanter, cheaper, more convenient, and easier and make the thing we don't want them to do, which is get in and drive their car by themselves, less convenient, more expensive, less pleasant, more difficult. Um, and so I would just love to get this phrase about congestion and traffic delay out of the conversation because it is so mired in the automotive mindset. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Alrighty, next I have in line is Tom Conlin. Tom, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Great, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate the board's perceptive and tough questions. Um, this draft plan surfaces something I think many of us have been saying for the past few years, and that's that the project lists that on which a lot of this is based, the project lists submitted by the jurisdictions really are just inadequate to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals. If there's kind of a disconnect right now between what we're what we're trying to accomplish and what how we're actually planning to get there and so the impression that i'm left with is that even if we get all the billions in funding that we're forecasting as needed here we still are going to fail to meet our safety and uh and, and other environmental goals so this to me right now as i'm looking at it this plan is frankly depressing and I think we need to sharpen it and prepare ourselves for the kind of competitive funding we know is going to be coming from the state, from the uh, Plan Bay Area 2050 process. We need to be much more aggressive about proven techniques like pricing. And, um, and we really need to start working on that now. We can't wait. So thanks for consideration of my comments today. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the next um, one I have in line is Pete Gang. Pete, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just uh, truncate my comments. I wholeheartedly agree with the, uh, the comments of the last three speakers, especially Eris, pointing out <clears throat> the, the absolute need for a new vision that accords with our climate aspirations. Uh, I appreciate the work that has gone into this plan, but I see it as being an extension of business as usual with, with small modifications. We absolutely must move quickly toward a transportation system based heavily on active transportation modes. We need the equivalent of a moonshot. We can do better. We have to do better. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pete. And then last up I have in line is Rick Coates. Rick, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Yes, um, I, I'm speaking on behalf of EcoRing, which promotes ecotourism and green travel. And uh, I certainly agree that we ought to uh, uh, extend SMART to Cloverdale. Uh, what seems to be missing is uh, the extension of SMART to Fairfield um, from Novato. And uh, I, I see this disconnect that people have talked about uh, when the Highway 37 issue comes up, uh, where even MTP seems to be more concentrated on, on highway uh, improvements than on rail improvements. 
And in fact, MTC uh, in its uh, uh, Plan Bay Area 2050 uh, hasn't uh, even included uh, the rail option really in uh, its, its plan for 2050, even though the state rail plan says it's supposed to be there by 2030. So uh, there's, I know you have coming up in your, one of your next agenda items, a letter on tw uh, plan uh, Bay Area 2050. Uh, I hope that you'll include that comment in there as well. Uh, beyond that, I certainly agree with everything that Eris said about uh, the balance that we need to create between the auto traffic versus bicycles and transit. Uh, and the tough part of it, of course, is making the, the, uh, the automobile more expensive, more inconvenient. Uh, that's not gonna be popular. And uh, uh, I know that you folks as elected officials don't like to do unpopular things. But the only way you can get away with it is to do the opposite thing, that is to make transit far more attractive and bicycles far more attractive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, Chair Gorn, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak. Great, thank you, Drew, very much. So let's bring it back to the board again. Thank you to all of the incredible staff work involved in preparing the draft comprehensive transportation plan. And I appreciate uh, all of your efforts on even more community outreach to validate and perhaps modify uh, some of the information in their priorities. And this will come back to the board. So um, I'm not seeing any other final comments. We, oh, we don't, yes, go ahead, Delinda. Yeah, I just want to echo um, Pete Gang's comments that, you know, our, our RCPA plan does not link up with this transportation plan. And, and again, emphasizing this, you know, the fact that 60% of our trips are under, would we say five miles? There's a, a heck of an opportunity here to shift modes. We have to shift people out of their, cars and onto the streets on alternative transportation. And the question is, how are we gonna do that? And like, I'd like to see this plan reflect that need. Thank you. Okay, Ariel, did you have another comment? I did, thank you, Chair Gorin. Um, I wanted to ask staff, um, and it can come back at a later meeting, uh, the question that Eris raised about how much of the bike path mileage we can separate out as class one pathway if that's feasible to have in the plan. I believe it's in there uh, in one of the tables. Um, it's on page 40 of the plan. Great, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Ariel. Mark Landman. Very quickly, agree with the comments that uh, Director Fisher just made. Uh, and I think it loops right back to our discussion about SMART. And I just wanted to say, I certainly support the request for inclusion of cities that aren't currently served, uh, who in fact have been often had promises at the polls that they would be served. And I just wanted to ask if we have could, could have consistent support and messaging for this, as this has been a board direction in our agenda pieces and presentations going forward. That would be my request. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're going to now have an east-west corridor linking the rail uh, with Guerneville and Sonoma. Oh, wait, I didn't say that. <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, okay, so let's move it forward. That was the report item. And let's move on to item 4.2, uh, planning the proposed comment letter of the Plan Bay Area 2050. And this is an action item. Suzanne, start it off. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. At the last board meeting, uh, we had a presentation from uh, Matt, or two, two meetings ago, I guess it was, from Matt Mahoney, Maloney from MTC, and uh, he went through sort of how MTC is handling Plan Bay Area. Uh, I'm sure you'll remember there was a robust discussion and a direction to submit a comment letter. So staff has reviewed the plan uh, and put together a draft comment letter, which was at uh, attached. Um, Janet and Chris in particular uh, put together 
the did, did the analysis on what's in the plan and what may be missing or is good in the plan. Uh, and so I don't know if Janet or Chris want to add to that, but the idea today was to get your feedback on a, on a proposed letter uh, that we could submit before the deadline, which is uh, later this month. Okay, I believe the letter is in our packet um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, great comments. Around the world in 80 days, perhaps, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, good comments about a lot of things. Uh, board members, uh, questions, comments on the proposed letter? And I see Mark Landman followed by Ariel Kelly. You got me before I even raised my hand. Uh, oh, this well, is maybe that was from before, sorry. <laughs> it could be, that's quite possible in the Zoom days. I just want, this loops right back into what I was saying about SMART earlier. I really appreciate the staff comments in particular and the concerns that they have about some competing pressures and priorities. And I like the way these were addressed. I like the way we underlined that concern about excluding the SMART rail project north of Windsor to Healdsburg and beyond. Uh, and I think I'd like to see consistent messaging as I mentioned on that. Likewise, I wanted to suggest, I really like bullet point three in page 95, where we very gently pointed out some concerns about modeling and data, that regional modeling and analysis tools may not always capture the many smaller scale and local benefits that our local projects not only could provide, but frankly need. I, and having seen recently some of the failings that occurred in housing related regional modeling uh, for arena numbers, I, I really like the pushback that there has to be a caveat about being pushed wholly under this umbrella because I see it as problematic potentially for us. So Great. that's my but, comment. So Mark, um, in the letter, are you suggesting that there is a need to revise language in the letter or you're just acknowledging that it addresses some of our comments? I am thanking staff for addressing our comments and hearing and I'm giving them that feedback so they know this is the support and the direction this board would like them to go. Great, thank you so much. Um, Ariel, I don't know if your hand was raised for this item or for the last item. For this one, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add uh, clearly as the Healdsburg representative, I am uh, eager to see SMART get to Healdsburg and beyond, but I am concerned that we're slightly burying the lead in this letter as the second to last bullet point uh, about regional transit projects. So I would uh, urge us to raise that to higher priority in the concern section so that it is clear that it is uh, a large concern, not the kind of second to last thing before we close the two page letter. Okay, might be a good suggestion. Suzanne, uh, is there a way to uh, realign some of the bullet points to emphasize that? Of course, sure. We'll, we'll make it the number one concern. Okay, great. Um, and Melanie. Yeah, I, I definitely- I bet you agreed with that. I would definitely <laughs> support that. And, and I think that, you know, it kind of goes back to my earlier comments is the fact that since the um, presentation from MTC staff and SCT staff on the plan, plan B area, facts have changed, um, information has changed. We have the earmark for the rail bridge at Healdsburg. And you also have, you know, we're, we're looking at the, you know, a, a very large chunk of change that will be available for this at the state level. We need to be able to compete for that money. And because they're in, and for a couple of reasons, and one is, is that again, you know, what rail addresses are the long trips and that it actually changes people, people's behavior and that it frees up development. The other piece that I think that MTC really misses out on, um, and it's really, you know, kind of re relates to the, the, what's currently the first bullet under rural communities is that it doesn't really understand that we have an incomplete transit system right now. And we need to complete that transit system so that we can meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals and we can improve people's quality of, quality of life and provide public transportation at an affordable rate. All of which are in um, theory are consistent with MTC stated goals as well. So we need them to help us, um, help them <laughs> achieve their goals. Uh, so yeah, I would be in favor of uh, shuffling some of those priorities, but if we could maybe have um, in a, you know, in, um, and maybe an additional emphasis on rural communities, 
yes, we're a rural community and some of us are, are disadvantaged, but I think that what gets lost when we go to, um, you know, when we're, when we're competing with some of these larger areas is that we have pent up potential, economic potential, social potential, cultural potential. It's not about, you know, um, servicing our, um, our, our disadvantaged population is important too, but also servicing our, um, our businesses, uh, people who have invested in our communities, in our rural communities. We wouldn't have the agri agricultural economy, the wine, you know, the flashy wine industry, the, bre the breweries and the, the tourism, if you don't have the people who pick the grapes and make the beds. And where do they live? They live in, they are dispersed throughout our rural communities. And those are the, the, those, that's what needs to get served. And when that is served, it's going to increase and benefit the entire economy. That's kind of why, you know, our, our urban centers that draw so much of our, our tourism and have so much of our, um, you know, our winery businesses, our brewery and our, and, and, and our, manu and our manufacturing, well, guess where those people live? Guess where those employees live? They, they are dependent on our rural areas. And I think that we can tease that out and express that a little bit more clearly in that bullet point. And I'd like to, I'd like to see that I'd happen as well as see the, uh, the, uh, the emphasis of completing the smart line a little bit higher in the, at the top of the list of the bullets that we would like. Okay, great. Thanks, Melanie. All right, any other comments from the board members? Sarah? Hey, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, following Melanie, not only do we have pent up potential, we also have accomplishments that we can brag about, the potential we have exhibited. And I think that's important to add here because rural is really a put down in the rating world, not just in transportation, but in the medical industry, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we need to do is add a sentence bragging about who we are with the RCPA, with all our city climate action committees, all of that brag I think needs to stay, be put in there so that there is a pride that goes along with this designation where they're trying to minimize us. We shouldn't be minimized for all the potential that we've shown and that we have in our future. Okay, Any, anyone else? David. I have to unmute David. Sorry. Um, Thank you. I'm supportive of sending a letter as written, well-crafted, so thank you for that. I think it makes the points that we want to make at the same time. Uh, all these items have been, I can tell you, have been talked about with staff. And just on the, uh, you know, adding SMART to Healdsburg, I think uh, Suzanne laid out the, probably the most logical path for that to happen is through an amendment. There still exists a slight possibility that could be added to the plan. That always depends upon how much of the environmental document and the modeling they'd have to go back and do. They are doing the public comments, so you'd think they'd have to do some. But it also would mean um, we would use the federal earmark, of course, as uh, an impetus. We would also need to use the entire probably 49 million that we've set aside for transit capital projects um, for that in order to entice MTC to come up with the other 55 million which I think that is uh, starts to make it a little more of a, um, a, you know being able to accomplish. I can also tell you from well from Smart's standpoint, it, it's really dependent again upon the um, extension of the sales tax. Um, they they could they could find the uh, capital within the extension of the sales tax through bonding um, to get to Healdsburg. So I uh, just want to put those out there as well. Um, but I'm in favor of the other issues going forward. I think it makes for a uh, um, you know, um, a, a good solid stance. And then it's really about the details of finding the path forward uh, to really kind of entice staff uh, to help us not hinder, uh, including it in either this plan or the plan that will immediately uh, be amended as followed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think we do need to move to public comment. So Drew, any public comment on this letter? Yes, we do have uh, three members of the public who wish to speak. Let me get that up and ready. 
All right, the first person I have in line is Steve Bertelbaugh. Steve, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew, and thank you, Chair Gorin and members. Um, we should note that the uh, uh, Plan Bay area does include uh, long distance rail that includes the uh, high speed rail uh, in its uh, list of uh, favored projects. Um, I, I think it should include uh, SMART to Sue soon because that will serve uh, uh, the uh, Sonoma Valley area. And uh, uh, it is in the state rail plan for completion by 2040. Uh, that is for passenger service. We already have freight service coming in on that line. Uh, so uh, uh, it would be very helpful to include that request in the uh, letter. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, the next person I have in line is Jake McKenzie. Jake, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Uh, I, am, I am unmuted. Okay. You are. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity uh, to draw your attention as you submit a letter uh, to MTC to the implementation plan which is uh, attached uh, to the document and particularly transportation strategies. And this speaks to exactly what Steve Bertelbaugh was talking about, uh, to build a next generation transit network that's under Roman numeral nine um, of the implementation plan section, where it does in fact uh, talk about expand and modernize the regional rail network and I would um, endorse Mr. Bertelbaugh's uh, comments on that. Uh, those of you uh, who've been around for a while know that in fact, the introduction of an implementation plan to the previous Plan B area uh, proved to be quite effective in getting a, uh, the CASA compact in front of the legislature. So um, with no apologies whatsoever, I would en endorse a uh, inclusion of the uh, smart rail project connecting up to Cordelia Junction and um, in fact modernizing the regional rail network as the state rail plan suggests. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Jake. Uh, the last person I have in line is Rick Coates. Rick, I have, per I have permitted you to speak, Rick. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, Steve and, and Jake are exactly on the money here. Uh, so I won't repeat what they said, but just to add to it the fact that uh, if you'll consider what the effect might well be on tourism and getting those tourists out of their cars, if we were connected to the, the national rail network at Sassoon uh, with Amtrak, and uh, uh, I think that we would find that uh, that we could reduce some of the traffic and get some of those tourists out of their automobiles. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rick. Uh, Chair Gorn, I do not see any other members of the public who wish to speak. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe I heard uh, members of the public talk about emphasizing our desire to connect uh, the, tr the smart train going east uh, to the Capitol Corridor, and I would echo that as well. Uh, so if we can add that to the letter, that would be great. Any other board comments? Uh, David, did you have another comment? Mark Landman has another comment, but David, do you wanna reiterate anything? No. Okay, Mark? Just very quickly, no, I'm not unsupportive of the consideration of sending Smart East, but before we expend any political or typewriting even capital on doing that, I would like to see us nail down Smart in our region, in particular in service to Healdsburg and Cloverdale. We seem to be having a very hard time uh, opening this back up to full Cloverdale and due to the significant changes on the ground here. So I certainly hate to muddy the waters by opening it up further. Once we get that done, I could get behind that very easily. So just, just a slightly differing viewpoint. Thank you. 
what we might do is say our top priority is to complete the train to Cloverdale, but a distant priority would be to connect the train uh, to the Capitol Corridor. I could certainly personally agree with that, Madam Chair, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm looking to you, Suzanne. Uh, we had a lot of comments, um, Direct some rewordings. Director Lemus has her hand up. Oh, sorry, um, Director Lemus. Thank you. Uh, I actually just wanted to echo what Director Lemon stated. I, I do think we need to prioritize uh, smart completing smart here in Sonoma County first before we start focusing on other areas. So I, I just wanted to echo that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Esther. Okay, so back to uh, Suzanne. Have you captured our comments and have a way forward with uh, redrafting or modifying the letter? Could I uh, run through what I've heard? And I may have missed something. So yes. uh, if Janet caught it, she can jump in too. But uh, first I heard to move the regional transit projects bullet item up to be the first bullet. So we're not bearing the lead. Uh, include in that bullet that our top priority is going uh, to Healdsburg, then Cloverdale, then East. Uh, that uh, we should, in the introduction, do a little bit of bragging on who we are about our CPA and uh, what rural, what it means to have rural and suburban and urban uh, land use types within our county. Um, that I think that was the bulk of what I heard. Did I miss something? I think those were the three or four major points that I heard. Janet, did you hear anything else? Okay. okay. Other board members, and I'm seeing no other hands raised. So uh, if you can capture that, I think we're happy. And so we probably need a motion and a second. Uh, to amend this letter, modify the letter, and move it forward. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the item. Madam no, Chair, I'd be happy to second it. Okay, uh, Cloverdale and then um, Katati. I like the two C cities. This, this is this really good coming together? Drew, can we have a roll call vote, please? Absolutely. So on the motion from Director Bagby. Director Bagby. Aye. <laughs> uh, Director Fisher. Yes. Director Judice? Yes. Director Gurney? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Director Landman? Yes. Director Lemus? Aye. Director Rabbit? Aye. Vice Chair Rogers? Aye. And Chair Gorn? Aye. Thank you so much. David, since you are the board member that has a hard stop at 420, uh, or is there an item that you want to make sure that you participate in of the uh, and then we'll move that up and then go back to the rest. Well, I was, I was successful in pushing that back an additional 15 minutes. So if we can keep going, whatever you need me for, I don't think we have okay. a forum. All right, board really fast, board and community, good luck. Uh, okay, so let's move on to item 4.3, highways identify the priority projects for the 2022 State Highway Operations and Protection Program. I love that name, SHOP. <laughs> Where's the supermarket? I want to go shop there. <laughs> Suzanne, why don't you introduce the item? And this is an action item. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will turn this over to James, who uh, has been working with Caltrans on this process, uh, something we've done over the last number of years, provided input, but I will hand it off to James to go through the staff report. Thank you. So this is a... Uh, item on the State Highway Operations and Protection Program. It is a programming item that occurs every two years where SCTA will send in a letter to make sure that we identify our local priorities to be included in that shop programming. It is a program that uh, is not a funding program. It's a program that Caltrans controls the funds and they do the implementation of the program themselves. The, the, the um, program itself has planning phases as well as the after planning phases that occur. 
to prioritize the project, Caltrans has a transportation asset management plan, a state highway system management plan, um, as well as a 10-year shop list that they develop that are all part of those planning efforts that occur up front to prioritize what their needs are. From there, the, pro the projects are then programmed. Once they're programmed, then they move into what's called the post planning, which is your environmental design and construction of the individual projects that would be programmed. This 2022 shop will be developed uh, through the fall into the winter and then will be adopted by the California Transportation Commission in the spring. To have a project be included in the shop, it is required to have a project initiation document that has been completed by June 30th. So we're looking at projects that have those PIDs, project initiation documents included, but we can still recommend projects that don't have them for future shop cycles as well to make sure that we are making clear to Caltrans what our local priorities are. Uh, within your packet each month and this month as item number 5.4.4, you'll see there's the highway report that also includes the shop list that breaks it down into four categories. The first category is those project initiation documents. And then the next three categories are those post planning, which are the uh, environmental design and construction of the shop that's being implemented. So we're looking at the, 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 the planning effort moving into the implementation of the projects. And uh, with that, I would turn it back over and ask for direction to send the letter and any input on projects that can be added to the draft letter that's included in your staff report. Great, thank you so much, James. Uh, let's and and I really wanted to thank you. There are a couple of projects on there that are really important for Sonoma Valley, and I appreciate the inclusion of those projects, uh, especially the shoulder widening of Highway 12. This is something that Caltrans proposed uh, and met with me on, and sadly it slipped off because of the right of way acquisition was going to be. Um, too expensive for them, so they had a big gulp, but we know with the fire evacuations that we've had along Highway uh, 12 in the Sonoma Valley, it is essential, and the fatalities that we've had of cyclists, it's not only important to move forward on the multi-use path, which we are doing, but also widening the shoulders, absolutely, and the traffic signal at, at um, 8th Street East, Suzanne and I have been um, trying to figure out how in the heck that came off of the shop program over a decade ago, but it happened. So um, I'm, I'm comfortable and really uh, so pleased that staff captured some of my priorities, but let's hear it from the board and I'm seeing no hands raise. There's Sarah Gurney. Thank you, Go Madam ahead, Sarah. Chair, thank you. Say, uh, James, I would like to, Sebastian, to have two projects considered in this uh, on State Highway 116. They're actually all of one. There are two intersections on South Main, uh, one at Burnett, and then uh, the next one down at Fellers Lane. These are for the improved crosswalks. They've been through phase one on our end uh, with design completed and cost estimates. And I think they would be a great addition to the shop list. They're not, you know, terribly expensive, I hope, and they're not really dramatic, but they are a very critical safety feature for uh, people traveling on that road, pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers as well. Thank you for that consideration. Thank you, Sarah, for that suggestion. Uh, Director Lemus. Thank you, I just have a question. Uh, is the list items one through eight, is that an order of priority? And if it is not, my, my thought and suggestion would be to uh, increase the priority of um, the widening of, of streets or shoulders that would uh, be evacuation routes given, um, unfortunately, the, the fire risk that we have now, the increased fire risk in our community. I would just ask that those be prioritized and maybe go up a little higher on the list. Thank you, Esther, I appreciate that. Uh, any other board member suggestions? David Rabbit? Yeah, I just wanted to make mention um, because we found this out the hard way, well, not the hard way, but the reality is that uh, on a state highway, if it's on the shop for an intersection improvement, for instance, 
the state will pay for the lights on their quadrant, but not the lights on the other quadrants. So it becomes a, a pretty considerable local share. Um, so I just want to point that out that it um, it does create um, you know an issue that you have to deal with in terms of getting things forward. And I will also say that um, seemingly where in the quote unquote old days, a traffic signal might be uh, less than a million dollars. Um, we've had traffic signals upwards seven, eight, eight million. Uh, by the time that you do um, turn pockets, expand the uh, right of way, uh, and then of course by doing that now you're in the usually the drainage, which means you're in an environmental situation and you're doing mitigation. So I just put that all out there because it does get um, expensive quickly. And we've been working on a couple of different uh, 116 um, signalizations that have gone well, but it doesn't come without a significant price. Shop money uh, is not free money overall for projects. Thank you for that suggestion. It's not only expensive, both uh, as a local match and state funds, but it's very, very time consuming. Uh, former Supervisor Valerie Brown identified a light at Madrone on Highway 12, and it took over 10 years uh, for that light to actually be installed. So it's not something that's quick and dirty. And just because we include something on this letter does not mean that the state is going to jump on board and say, oh, all good, we're gonna fund those. So, um, and I'm comfortable with the um, improving the prioritization of the shoulder widening and adding those two intersections. But Suzanne, James, your thoughts? Yeah, the list was, the list was not in any priority order. It was just grouped by highway. Uh, and uh, to, to move up the evacuation route, shoulder widening on the list, that's a very easy change. And then the, uh, the, kind of the complete street ads for the two intersections in Sevastopol, um, we, can, we can add that to the list as well and before we send the letter and have the chair sign it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and I appreciate the board's discussion of this. Uh, Drew, public comment on this item? I'm on mute. Um, I see one person um, wants to speak. Let me get that timer up. All right, Tom Conlin, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew. I, I appreciate the uh, chance here. It's great to see Sonoma Valley listed on the shop report, and I appreciate all the effort that's gone into getting us here. I also support the additions and changes that were just made. Uh, thank you again. I'll be sharing this with my uh, neighborhood. Thanks, Tom. Oh. Yeah, we've, it's about time. Thank you. And I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak. Great, let's bring this back to the board. And there were some proposals that we modify the letter. Uh, this is an action item. So I need a motion and a second and a roll call vote, please. Director Fisher has her hand up. I was just going to offer to move oh, on. Sure, go on. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Delinda. Second? All second. Thanks, Chris. Roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Director Bagby? Aye. Director Fisher? Yes. Director Judice? Yes. Director Gurney? Yes. Director Kelly? Yes. Director Landman? Yes. Director Lemus? Yes. Director Rabbit? Aye. Vice Chair uh, Rogers? Aye. And Chair Gorin. Aye. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item. Um, oh, well, thank you, Chris, for delivering a report on the future of transit. We'll turn this right over to you. Well, so I actually was not able to attend our ad hoc this last week. We had the memorial for uh, Officer Mary Lou Armour in, in Santa Rosa. So I'm going to turn it right back over to uh, to our uh, wonderful director to see if Suzanne has a report. Sure, uh, I can I can give a quick update. Uh, we did meet, and uh, the committee heard a presentation from my counterpart over in Napa, uh, Kate Miller, who runs the Napa Valley Transportation Authority. 
unlike the SCTA, the NVTA is also the transit provider. They have a single transit provider over in Napa. Uh, and they've been doing an interesting approach. Uh, it started in their smaller jurisdictions of doing on-demand transit service. But during the pandemic, they expanded that into the city of Napa. Uh, so they had Kate provided an overview of how that program has worked and how it has allowed them to alter some of their fixed route service. Um, and she went through the, a presentation on that, which was pretty interesting. Um, in addition to that, we had a brief update on um, the work happening at MTC with the Blue Ribbon Task Force and the local operators, the three bus providers provided um, a quick update on the work they've they've done over the last month or so on the unified brand effort. Um, honestly, they've been swamped with a variety of other topics, so they've met a couple of times, but uh, their report out was fairly brief. So uh, we look forward to another meeting, um, probably in late August, uh, but it hasn't been scheduled yet. Thanks, Suzanne. And it was a fascinating discussion about the programs that they've been able to craft in Napa. And it may be if we have uh, some time on a future board agenda, it might be good to uh, bring that report forward because I think all of us would benefit. It's very thought provoking and aspirational, uh, perhaps for Sonoma County's consideration as well. And uh, thank you, Chris, for representing the city at the memorial for Mary Lou Armour. Absolutely important and devastating for so many of us. Uh, any other uh, comments from the committee members? And I'm seeing no hands raised, so that is a report. And um, thank you so much, Suzanne, for arranging for that. It was a uh, very interesting report. So let's move on to item 4.5, uh, which is, as I mentioned last year, or last year, last year, actually we did talk about it last year, of appointing a, a committee to explore funding options for the expansion and implementation of our climate mobilization strategy and initiatives moving forward. And the board um, very enthusiastically echoed uh, their support for that la at the last meeting. And I said, if you want to serve, please let me know. And uh, um, the board chair, uh, Linda Hopkins of the Sonoma County uh, Board of Supervisors did indicate she was interested. She has agreed to serve as chair for a future committee but I haven't heard from anyone else on this board about their interest in serving. And so if you want to serve on an ad hoc committee to explore potential funding uh, for um, um, mobilization strategies or climate strategies moving forward, maybe you could raise your hand in this discussion. And I see Esther. Esther, are you, did you wanna make a comment or did you wanna to volunteer to serve? I'm interested in volunteering to serve on this ad hoc. Okay, and Chris Rogers and Gerard and the Linda, I may have to put some names in the in the hat to pull. We're allowed to have five people, uh, yes. including Linda. But uh, and I see three hands raised: Chris mm -hmm. Le or Esther Lemus, Gerard, and the Linda. And I see Chris maybe withdrew his hand. Um, and so that's, that's the committee that I think I have interest from. We do have, I'm trying to pull that up again. There we go. Esther and Gerard and Delinda and Chris. So Chris, did you have a comment or are you interested in helping to serve? No, I was going to offer to help to serve. Uh, it looks like we would be at six at that point, so that would work. If not, if one of our newer members is interested in, in being on it, please let me know. We, we can have six members. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm missing, oh, the Linda. Okay, good. So the names that I have are Linda, Esther, Gerard, Chris, and I may be missing someone. Who else Delinda. raised their hand? Commissioner, uh, Director Linda. 
Fisher, Chris Gerardo. One, two, five. three, four, five. I'm uh, five. Got it. I'm, I'm saying, wait a minute. I miss, I'm not coming up with a six, but this is good. Thank you so much for volunteering. And uh, Chris is the chair of our transit ad hoc. So hopefully you'll have a little time to slip another ad hoc in. Chris, appreciate it. And so um, Tanya, thank you so much for helping to shepherd this effort forward and connect with the, uh, with the five who volunteered to serve on appropriate timing and then bring the reports forward to the board as you have some decision points or opportunities to comment. So thank you once again, I appreciate you coming forward to volunteer to serve on this. So let's move on to something that may take a little bit of time and hopefully we can conclude it before Director Rabbit has to leave. This was uh, at the request of some board members to support local action to ban new gas stations and transition to electric vehicles. And Tanya, I see you queuing up um, for a um, uh, to share your screen. And so take it away, either Suzanne or Tanya. I'll go ahead and start unless Suzanne, you had anything you wanted to lead off no, with? Please All right. do. Thank you, Madam Chair and Directors. Uh, so this is a local gas station land use prohibition topic, and I will run through the slides here. Um, so just a brief overview, I'll give some background, talk about recent actions that have been taking place in our local jurisdictions, cover some potential areas of our CPA support, key points of our resolution or proposed resolution, and then staff recommendation. So the key issue before you is to, first of all, consider what the key elements are of a resolution supporting local action to ban new gas stations. And then second, how our CPA should support our members in adopting such gas station bans. I would like to give a shout out to BC Caps, who is our newest staff member of the RCPA, and he did a lot of the legwork and research for the staff report that you see here today. So I just wanted to give a shout out to him. Um, so in terms of some background on a policy context, um, as you well know, we have a number of state level executive orders and policies around uh, achieving zero emissions uh, with our vehicles by 2035, uh, in terms of no more gas powered cars sold in 2035. And then our goal of by 2045 at the state level achieving carbon neutrality. So it really sets us up for this discussion. And then in terms of local policies, all 10 of our jurisdictions have adopted climate emergency resolutions, as well as the RCPA. We have our Sonoma Climate Mobilization Strategy that has set out a number of objectives around eliminating um, emissions from vehicles. And a key part of that, or one of the strategies that we had identified is to um, find ways to limit permitting of new fossil fuel infrastructure. And then lastly, we have Petaluma leading the way with uh, the first in the nation uh, gas station ban. So in terms of our current conditions, uh, the map here shows the uh, gas stations that we currently have within Sonoma County. And these are uh, based on a report that was done uh, from 2010 to 2016. So not the most recent information, but, but fairly current. Um, and our jurisdictions are continuing to receive new applications for gas stations. Uh, there are, my understanding is we have about four pending right now um, or it going through the process. And as you uh, are well aware, I think there are numerous impacts on public health and the environment from gas stations and, and uh, gasoline. And then lastly, we have existing land use policies that are designed to facilitate city center development. And when Petaluma did its uh, background research and preparation for its ordinance um, on the gas station ban, um, it found that um, all of its residents had multiple gas stations available to them within a five minute drive. And also looking at uh, future development that was planned as part of their general plan, um, that that would still be the case even with those new developments. So indicating that we don't need any more new gas stations to, to meet the needs of our community. Um, so in terms of recent actions, I mentioned Petaluma's um, action in March of this year to adopt ordinances prohibiting new gas station land uses. And then we do have several jurisdictions that are in the process of considering similar types of uh, ordinance, ordinances, um, including the city of Santa Rosa, Katati, and then in Sebastopol, its climate action uh, committee is scheduled to discuss this topic at its meeting uh, coming up on Wednesday of this week. So 
So potential areas that the RCPA could support our local jurisdictions, we could provide additional analysis around gas station locations and similar to what Petaluma did as part of its ban, you know, look at how gas stations are located relative to the rest of our uh, population centers. We could create guidance documents for planning staff to develop similar bans in their jurisdictions and then coordinate across uh, the county to identify barriers and strategies to address those barriers. And then uh, lastly, in terms of the potential resolution, we've included a number of um, proposed recitals and conclusions for board input in the staff report. I won't go through those in detail now, given the time, uh, but based on board direction today, we would propose to bring back a uh, draft resolution for your discussion and potential adoption at your September uh, board meeting. So in terms of our recommendation, we request your direction on the type of support that you would like the RCPA staff to provide to our member jurisdictions, and then any feedback or input that you have on what you'd like to see in that resolution that comes back to you in September. And with that, I will turn it back over to the chair for board questions and discussion. Thank you. Oh, and Chair Gorin, you're on mute. Thank you, Tanya. You missed what I said. I said, thank you, Tanya. Um, okay, so really briefly, and then I'll open it up to board questions. Um, I, I think this makes some sense to move forward on this, but I'm not sure about the timing. And I'm also not sure about the other vehicles we have in vehicle fleet, whether it's buses or trucks or boats, emergency vehicles. Um, and I know that there is um, movement in the state to electrify vehicles, but I'm not sure it's electrification of every vehicle in California. So could you give us some understanding about how that is moving forward? So our transit providers are required to electrify their fleets. I don't have the time frame uh, on top of mind, but I'm sure Dana could comment if, if you'd like that information. Um, and, and there is a move to electrify heavy duty fleets as well. Um, so we definitely need to do that to achieve our GHG emission goals. I would like to clarify in terms of the item before you today is that we're really focusing on um, new gas station land uses and not really um, wanting to connect that to our electrification. So we feel that the, um, you know, we have plenty of gas stations to meet our current and foreseen needs in the near future. And so we just don't feel like it makes sense to continue permitting new gas stations. So really trying to separate that from the electrification issue. Okay, and the, the, the other question I have, where are the applications uh, for the four new proposed gas stations? Uh, let me see. Let's see, we have one in Santa Rosa, actually two I think are in Santa Rosa, and then two are in the unincorporated um, county. Um, one on Highway 116 in Monterio, and then Petaluma Gas Club, south of Petaluma. Okay, great, thank you. Let's open up to the board for comments, questions. And uh, let's start with you, Chris Rogers, and Linda Fisher, and then maybe go to David Rabbit in case he has questions or comments before he has to leave. Yeah, and I'll be really brief just uh, in the interest of time. Uh, we do have two that are pending in Santa Rosa. We also do have a policy that's making its way forward uh, that should be heard at our Climate Action Committee uh, shortly. I think uh, probably August is our timeline for hearing that as well. Um, and so what I have heard most from advocates, uh, folks with Comgas and other environmental groups is to keep it simple. Uh, do something that is uh, forward looking at new stations so that we don't get into legal fights about the ramifications for the current ones that are proposed or the ones that are existing. Um, and, and so I, I just want to express that as well to, to make sure that we are keeping it simple. And then my city attorney loves when I do this, but I'm also going to offer her up uh, to help uh, <laughs> since we're already doing the work in Santa Rosa. You have a model in Petaluma that you can draw on. And then you have work that's being done here in Santa Rosa that we can draw on to really make a um, uh, hopefully an ordinance that could just go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction with minimal uh, mi minimal review needed to implement it. So wanted to throw that out as well. Great, thank you, and I'm sure that Sue would thank you as well. <laughs> uh, Delinda Fisher. 
Thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, the trend that we're seeing along the one-on-one -on -one corridor um, in Novato and Petaluma is that these are not mom and pop gas stations that are being um, offered and, and it is giant Costco, Safeway, those sorts of um, retailers who are wanting to put in these mega stations in order to attract customers to their store by offering what is called cheap gas, which we know there isn't really such thing. So um, well, it might save some people money, you know, it's really, they're really problematic in the fact that they're so large um, and that they attract so much traffic. Um, and so um, we were pleased to ban them in our city and really pleased that we were the first in the country to do so unknowingly. Um, and that's gotten a lot of attention and, and no pushback. So just wanted to voice that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, David, comments, questions? I just, uh... It was the first I heard of the uh, the one south of Petaluma, so I'll need to do a little more research. I haven't seen that come by my uh, my desk yet. I know that we had a uh, we had two, um, and I thought you said Monterio on one sixteen. Is that true? Because there was two at one time yes. proposed on one sixteen. One was at the corner of one sixteen and Stony Point on the southwest corner, and um, I did uh, convince those folks that that was probably not a great idea, and they went elsewhere. Uh, so I do appreciate that. I'm supportive overall. I, I do agree. You know, I think the, uh, after talking to people about those, the mom and pop uh, gas stations kind of are yesterday's um, business model, quite frankly. And I think it's really about the massive amount of gallons that one needs to pump in order to, um, you know, uh, work going forward. And most of them are on the 101 corridor. My concerns are kind of mirroring yours originally, uh, Susan, in terms of are there deserts out in the, I don't know if uh, the West County, North County, uh, more rural areas um, have uh, issues. We haven't heard of it, so I'm doubting that there is. Um, therefore, I'm uh, supportive going forward. I do wonder what the effect overall on uh, pricing would be. Uh, it's hard to know right now with the price going up regardless. So that's it for me. Thank you. It goes up, it goes down, uh, but I do know, and I appreciate one of the commenters uh, commenting that sometimes in the rural areas, they need access to gasoline uh, for evacuations. Yeah, nice, and nice. I haven't heard that that was an issue in our fires, but potentially could be. Uh, maybe not in Santa Rosa, but in some of the outlying areas, uh, because that's where the fires are for the most part. Uh, board member comments? For the uh, Mark Landman, Sarah Gurney, Melanie Bagby, woohoo, all of them. Uh, Esther Lemus. <laughs> this one should have been on earlier, but here we are. Sometimes batting last is good. So, yeah, you know, I asked for this at our last meeting, and I appreciate staff and the support of my colleagues in bringing this forward because it was one of those rare moments as an elected official to have a small epiphany. Like many of us, electeds are always sensitive to things that could be controversial, even if they're good things. And when I first heard of this, I thought, well, this may be a good thing. It likely is controversial. But the amazing thing, when I got outside this presubitions, the little box that I live in and we all live in, and actually thought about it, I recognized, at least in the cases of most of the cities in this county, this thing that I thought would be a loud, problematic thing is just a simple little whisper. It's easy. We could have done this years ago. Nobody is saying we're going to ban gas stations. Nobody's saying we want to make it more difficult. Why would we want people to drive further to get gas? Gosh, that would be silly. But if we recognize, and I think we can do easily, I think all my colleagues can picture the cities, picture where the gas stations are, picture your neighborhoods, people's travel and transit patterns, and ask yourself, do I have enough in infrastructure to serve them well? Uh, the answer, surprisingly, is yes, we have more than enough. And with that, why would we build more? I have never heard anybody say to me uh, about a gas station built, wow, that really makes the neighborhood look better, thanks. And I've never seen a gas station that doesn't link, leak eventually. What they are are necessary evils to support internal combustion, internal combustion engines. And they have to be here for some time to come. But seeing as they are, necessary evils, if they're truly not necessary to build any more, then why would we do it? So with that, more importantly, I think the timing is absolutely perfect. I think that 
if we can get most of the cities in the county to do this, the message that goes out to people to rethink their suppositions about certainly things to do with the environment could have some powerful effects. And I think the move to battery electrical vehicles, BEVs, actually does have some beneficial, usually beneficial effects, even if it doesn't, isn't a total panacea for what we face in the transportation sector. So when we come back from public comment, I'm gonna move, like to move this, and I would ask three things. First as a board, of course, we asked for a resolution re recommending ceasing all construction of new gas stations as described, simple to the point. Second, that in that we include a request that all member jurisdictions of RCPA consider agendizing this item so the discussion can begin and hopefully most of us will adopt it. And then lastly, and I wanna thank uh, Direct Vice Chair Rogers, I wanted to ask our staffs if directed to bring them down to work with our CPA and our neighboring localities, and I really was thinking of Santa Rosa, to craft not only a basic measure, but also one that has the fullest legal protection. Now we've had no pushback whatsoever, but just thinking of what we've seen historically, things like the Reach Code, Windsor and Santa Rosa, it makes sense that we all work from the same playbook and from somebody who has a deep base of, of legal talent to do that. So that's what I'd like to ask for, and that's what I'll be uh, moving after we come back from public comment. Thank you, Great. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mark, for being so detailed and specific. I appreciate that. Uh, Sarah Gurney, followed by Melanie Bagby. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Mark, for being ahead on emotion there. We'll get to it. So I want to thank uh, Santa Rosa and Petaluma for their leadership on this issue. How fabulous to have you out there ahead of us. Our Climate Action Committee is looking at this Wednesday, and I'm hoping that we will be supportive here in Sebastopol. I also want to appreciate this offer of technical help from the RCPA staff. It's really going to address the issues of our council, of our business community, and our residents and visitors as well. If we have that analysis of where the stations are, who gets service, and it, if we have that confirmation, it's good the way it is, we can comfortably stop. That will really help this move forward. I like the idea of having um, the legal protection as much as we can all together. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sarah. Melanie Bagby, followed by Esther Lemus. Yeah, thank you. I really uh, appreciate um, Director Landman's comments, and I just want to thank the larger cities for for taking the lead on this. This is an example of um, a land again. This is a land use issue. And the time, this is the time is, it's not just now, the time is probably past. You know, when you look at the fact that we do general plans in, um, in periods of 20 years and we're looking at, you know, um, no, no gasoline cars being sold in California in 2030, we're actually a little uh, late on this. And it, yeah, why didn't, why didn't we think of this sooner? So um, I, I think it's really important for, for, for smaller cities to be able to depend on the, the legwork at our CPA, as well as the larger cities taking a lead on this. I really appreciate it because it will hopefully, you know, start a, a, a larger conversation. Um, you know, we're not going out and, and banning uh, existing gas stations. We're saying, you know what, we're, we probably are um, at um, saturation in, in most of our communities and we have a better way to leverage um, that those commercial properties that will be more beneficial to the tax bases in each of our communities. So, um, you know, that's that's how I, I plan to um, communicate these points to, to to my residents is that it's actually in our long term um, advantage to start planning. And again, yeah, in West County, in um, rural areas, there's no shortage of gas stations, but there's a shortage of electric charging stations if you drive an electric car. So you know, that needs to be the direction that we're going in. So thanks for staff and, and Tanya for great work on this and looking forward to um, getting this pushed through countywide. Thanks, Melanie. Esther Lemus. Thank you. So I, I definitely support this. Um, congratulations to Petaluma. I didn't realize you guys were the first in the country. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. Um, one is I know that uh, Chair Gorn raised a question about rural areas and, um, uh, access to to gas in evacuation um, in, in the event of an evacuation, and so I just want to make sure that um, I don't know if it would be RCPA who would look into that, but 
you know, I just for purposes of safety, I would want to make sure that um, that there is that we're not lacking access to gas for people who are out in these areas. Um, but otherwise, I do support it. Um, I would also support including in in the model resolution the state executive orders. Um, I think that I, I was not aware of, of those goals, um, and I and I believe that this resolution or or proposed resolution would be um, consistent with those future orders. Thank you. Thanks, Esther. Uh, Gerard. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, I'm in favor of this. Uh, obviously, Rona Park has plenty of gas stations. Uh, we also have a general plan that's open. So whatever is accomplished, uh, hopefully it can be accomplished expeditiously. <laughs> Good point. A number of us are moving through the general plan updates. So, okay. So I think we have uh, resounding support from the board. Let's hear from the public. And uh, to the public members, we received about five or six letters all articulating support for this and the urgency of this. So you don't necessarily have to repeat your letters. I think we got it, um, but, and, and we are running a little late. So uh, Drew, let's have public comment, but can we uh, ratchet it back to two minutes rather than three? Certainly. Uh, let me go change that. Let's go. Alrighty, and um, for those who submitted pre-submitted comments, I have posted them online on both the SCTA and the RCPA websites, as well as provided them to the SCTA, RCPA board of directors and staff. So with that, we will start with uh, Mike Turgeon. Mike, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. And thank you to the um, um, board uh, for bring, entertaining this resolution today. And um, thank you to Petaluma for putting it out there for everybody. Um, this is obviously an idea whose time came a long time ago. And uh, I would just say, if I was a politician in Sonoma County, I would be seeking out climate forward policies rather than waiting for them to come to my desk. Um, in, in people are scared people are scared about the fires. We had one over on Melita Road this morning. And so um, we just live in this fear all the time. And what uh, a ban on new gas station says is we're doing something. We're, we're getting ahead of this. So uh, I'd say, go for it. Don't wait for stuff to come through the public or whatever, figure out what you think is the best thing to do and just take the lead on it. Cause we would wish more politicians would take a lead. Thank you so much. All right, thank, thank you, Mike. Mike. Okay, the next one I have in line is an Alex Alexa Forrester. Alexa, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Claire. Thanks for this opportunity to provide input on this important matter and for staying long. I'll try to be brief. Just a really quick personal timeline. In 2017, during the Tubbs fire, my family evacuated for one week to stay in Sebastopol. Then in 2019, during the Kincaid fire, my colleague and his family evacuated from Windsor to our house in Santa Rosa. And then in 2020, during the Walbridge fire, a different colleague evacuated from Monterio to our house in Santa Rosa. I know these stories are not at all exceptional. That's kind of the point leaving our homes and hoping that they are there when we get back has become the unfortunate musical chairs of fire season for far too many of us now. But I'm sharing these brief details of my life to help illustrate a point about Sonoma County, which is that although we are carved up and organized into various political municipalities, when push comes to shove, we need each other and we are there for each other. With our collective use of fossil fuels, we together are hastening climate instability. And if we hope to see a livable future for Sonoma County, we need to come together and chart a new path forward. This is why I not only support my own city of Santa Rosa's recent steps towards halting new gas stations, but why I think it's imperative for this effort to be coordinated and simultaneously adopted by the county as a whole. I believe the resolution you are putting together can be a significant and necessary step to making this happen. I support the motion for a simple and strong resolution. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. All right, next in line, we have Woody Hastings. Woody, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thanks, Drew, can you hear me? I can hear you clear. Great, thanks so much. Good afternoon, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Woody Hastings, co-coordinator of the Coalition Opposing New Gas Stations. Congress is working to ensure that the last gas station to be built in Sonoma County has already been built. We're very glad to see the RCPA taking up this issue and we look forward to helping craft a resolution that offers helpful options, guidance, and encouragement to RCPA's member jurisdictions as they evaluate adopting prohibitive ordinances. Since its founding in 2019, Congress has led the successful effort to stop three new gas station proposals and have supported the efforts of the no gas here folks in Petaluma who successfully stopped the uh, Petaluma Safeway gas project. We don't want to keep doing this. There are currently four active proposals in the county. We, want it, we, we see these proposals as a waste of county and staff time and our time. Adopting prohibitions will free up time for everyone to work on advancing the clean, equitable, sustainable mobility options of the future. Sonoma County and its city should be focusing on improving facilities for pedestrians, bicyclists, affordable, accessible, convenient, clean emission trans public transit, and EV charging infrastructure in places where people already live, work, and play. Please keep the recommendations in the resolution simple. Prohibit the construction of new gas stations. The only instance where you may want to touch on existing gas stations is if an existing station seeks to expand the number of pumps at its station. Uh, a thought on how to phrase things. The resolutions could be could turn things around sort of, and instead of language about prohibiting new gas stations, it could be more about the city and or the county to cease accepting and processing new gas station permit applications. And last but not least, gasoline use imposes a deep and long-standing social injustice. In every drop that comes out of a gas dispenser, there's a trail of devastation for communities of color, indigenous communities, and the environment around the world that leads all the way back to the point of extraction of crude oil from the ground. It's time to stop this injustice and stop building new gas stations. Thank you very much. All right, Thanks, thank Woody. Uh, the next, uh, next one I have in line is Kevin Conway. Kevin, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew, and, and thank you to the board for, for taking this up. I agree with all of the speakers before me. You know, given this drought we're in and these temperatures that we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest, we can really feel how dire and scary the climate crisis is. I'm, tomorrow, I'm leaving for Sun River, Oregon. Uh, in our bolt for a family reunion and then from there up to Seattle. And when I told a friend this, uh, she said she was just in Sun River and had PTSD when she was there because it's in the middle of a, a forest and the temperatures there have been hotter than ever recorded. And it brought her right back to what she was experiencing in 2017. So I strongly support a ban on, on permits for all new gas stations. Uh, this uh, ban should include the elements that were suggested by the CONGAS ordinance. You know, if we're truly committed to getting to net zero emissions by 2030, we just have to do this. We want the community to know that we're serious about setting ourselves up for a future of rail and buses and bicycles and EVs and scooters uh, and getting out of our internal combustion engines once and for all. So. Uh, I, I please ban permits for new gas stations and, and hopefully that'll uh, encourage all the cities in our county to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, next I have in line is Lorianne Barber. Lorianne, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I will keep my comments brief. I am so appreciative to live in a county where this kind of resolution is being considered. So thank you for that. And a special thanks, I live in Katati. So I wanna shout out to Mark Landman for bringing this forward. Um, there really can be no denying that climate change is having a significant impact as many others have said. It's not somewhere else, it's not in the future, it's here and now. So it is important and imperative that we do all we can to stop that trajectory. We know that fossil fuel powered transportation is a significant contributor in Sonoma County and that must change. 
So I urge you to adopt this resolution and bring it to the cities and the county. We already have enough gas stations at this time and fewer will be needed in the future as more vehicles will be electric and other efforts are made to reduce VMTs. Um, and then I also want to add that with the, this resolution, I believe there could actually be a much greater impact as other cities, counties, and states may follow suit. This is yet another opportunity for Sonoma County to lead on climate. So let's do it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so the next I have in line is Tyra Benoit. Please forgive me if I said that wrong. Tyra, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Drew. It's Benoit, just for future reference. Um, I'm <laughs> a you. resident of Healdsburg and a new member of the Climate Action Advisory Committee to the RCPA. And I have to say that I'm very encouraged by the comments that people have made and by the comments of the people on the board. A few years ago, right after I lost my home in the Tubbs fire, I met with Supervisor Gorin, another fire survivor, and I was talking with her about the concept of a climate reality leadership corps in Sonoma County. I told her that I was having a very difficult time staying in Sonoma County. And if the leaders of Sonoma County would take this seriously and really act on climate, I would be wanting to stay here. Well, I relocated to Idaho in 2018, but last year, at the end of the year, I came home to Sonoma County, where I am hoping that we will continue to do so much more to address the climate emergency and really get to carbon neutrality by 2030. Um, so I agree with Lori's comments about putting Sonoma County on the map. Director Landman said that this was an important issue and it could create controversy, but that's a good thing. That will get your RCPA climate mobilization strategies out there in the public eye. And Healdsburg as a small town really needs your help pushing forward something like this. So thank you. Great, thank you, Tyra. Uh, next I have in line is Jenny Blaker. Jenny, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, and I'd like to especially thank Council Member Mark Landman to bring this, for bringing this to the agenda today. I'm a Qatari resident and I'm also co-coordinator co of the Coalition Opposing New Gas Stations, CONGAS, along with Woody Hastings. Um, of course, I urge you to support this and to support the cities and the county in prohibiting the permitting and construction of new gas stations. Um, I would also urge you to support the model ordinance submitted by Congas, um, which will help to keep it simple and focused on the effective prohibition of new gasoline stations and the expansion of existing gas stations with additional pumps. Keep it simple, no more new gasoline infrastructure. Um, people have already talked about the climate uh, crisis um, but there are so many other reasons as well for saying no to new gas stations. They have so many negative local health and environmental impacts, including pollution of air, soil, and groundwater. There are leaking underground storage tanks all over the county, which have to be cleaned up at great expense. Several have been abandoned. Um, we just don't need this anymore. Um, and um, so, also, <clears throat> it's such a waste of time and resources to process these applications. Instead, the county and city resources should be focused on appropriate land use planning that minimizes the need to drive cars, um, better public transportation, better facilities for bicyclists and pedestrians, and EV charging infrastructure in places where people already spend time, for example, where they live, work, shop at health centers and so on. That's it. Thank you very much for taking the time to discuss this in depth. And I look forward to you passing a, a, a resolution in September. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, Chair Gorn, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak. 
Great. Thank you, Drew, and thank you to all the commenters, um, especially those of you working on this item. Uh, and we appreciate the community being at the front. So it's pretty easy to take the actions that we're contemplating when we know we have great people working on this. And I want to add my thanks to Petaluma for their thoughtfulness and um, a willingness to step out and be the front leader on this. So I think we do, yes, I think we do uh, have a board support for this to bring it back. And I heard uh, many please keep it simple. Uh, thank you, Chris Rogers for volunteering, um, Ms. Gallagher. And I, so I, I guess I would ask the next steps. Tanya, are you going to reach out? Um, so Chris, I yeah. believe uh, I believe the council member from Katati has a motion he'd like to make, and I'll second it. And then I want to make a comment if yeah. I could. Great, and I just want to ask about next steps. Uh, and Mark will make the motion. Chris will second it. Uh, and thank you for being firm. But I want to ask about next steps, especially with drafting uh, a resolution. Are we going to reach out to RCPA and uh, County Council and City Attorneys? Uh, to move to really look at this and bring something simple back to us in September and then let it loose on the cities. Yes, that would be my plan. Okay, great. I, I would I would just add to that Corey O'Donnell, who is our council, uh, has been listening in, has done some preliminary investigation on this, but uh, I do think we're going to rely on you know, support from Petaluma and appreciate the, the um, opportunity to work with Sue Gallagher as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want, we will try and keep it simple. Um, <laughs> everything in government can't always be simple. So, so sometimes, you know, we've got to make sure it's legally what it needs to be. And sometimes that isn't simple. So I, I can't promise it's going to be super simple, but we will, I, I hear that direction and we will try and make it uh, as, as much as possible. But we know that when city attorneys and county council get involved, there's probably a lot of whereases and numbers and bullet points. And I, I'm not disparaging you, Corey. I know you're going to do a great job working with city attorneys. But uh, anyway, we'll move this forward. Mr. Lamon, Director Lamon, it's all yours. And I think we took note of the three points that you want to make. But go ahead and make them again. Well, I fully intend to do that. And I also wanted to say <laughs> I do get it. There's a natural bifurcation here, and I think it's understandable. I think for many of us in the cities, probably even up to Santa Rosa, although it's more difficult for them, we can almost sit here in our heads and do the mental inventory required, as I talked about earlier, to reach the conclusion that we're really good with infrastructure. We have more than enough. I do see this as more difficult for the county and potentially for you a longer, more time intensive action that needs to be taken just due to the immensity of spaces because you want to make sure that you're covering everybody's needs and not actually making them drive farther to get gas which would be counterproductive to all of our interests with that i don't know if there's a need if we all county and cities have to move together at the same time we may not be able to but with that i would like to see this very firmly stay simple i would like to see it stay with our staff i appreciate the offer from Santa Rosa and support that entirely and then have initial draft come from them and then if there's pushback from any city other city attorneys or if part of the process then we could certainly deal with that but with that I really want to underline that so first I'm going to move this asking again for three things that we ask for a simple resolution as described today for who prohibiting new gas stations and the expansions of fueling infrastructure at existing gas stations Second, that in this resolution request, respectfully, that all member jurisdictions of RCPA consider agendizing this item, beginning the discussion, and hopefully adopting a similar ba a ban. And then lastly, that as I mentioned, we press our staff to work with the cities and most notably with Santa Rosa's fine legal department to make sure we have something that's simple, basic, that we can all use, and that is as legally defensible as possible. Thank you. Um, Chris, over to you. Yeah, I'll second it. And then I just wanted to make a comment because I heard uh, concerns from some members and, and some folks in the public spoke about it. 
about evacuation route planning. And uh, just thought I'd throw out a, a tip to folks that we were talking to uh, some staff out in Atlanta and they'd actually been able to secure, interestingly enough, some federal funds to do um, electrification uh, charge stations on their uh, evacuation routes as part of their planning. And so our staff is looking into how to best utilize that and how to compete for some of that funding. So it might be something uh, for your cities to look at as well. And then I'm good on the resolution. I think it's all great. Thank you. And I will add one interesting wrinkle, which I hope will go away soon. And that with the power shutdowns, we had long lines queued up at the gas stations because they were without power and many were filling up uh, gas cans to power uh, generators uh, in anticipation of the power shutdowns. So um, it's not as easy as it sounds if there's, we're experiencing some challenges, but yes, Drew, go ahead and have a roll call vote, please. I, I see two other members, yeah. board members oh. wishing to speak. Uh, Fisher Comments. and Kelly. Go ahead, Delinda, and then Ariel. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, that since we ban gas stations, um, we have been on the local news, the national news, um, Tokyo news. I have an interview with The Guardian tomorrow. And um, Stand.Earth is the name of an organization that's working on this countrywide. And we've been on local calls with them as well. So it already has spread throughout the nation. Um, and everyone knows, knows our name. And so great to add the whole county to, to this. Thank you. Thanks to Linda. Ariel? Thank you, Madam Chair. That's great to hear, Director Fisher. Um, I just wanted to comment, um, I've actually been working uh, with Congress since uh, I was on the Sonoma County Planning Commission when we had a gas station application uh, that was before us and met with Jenny uh, Blaker and Woody Hastings, two of the public commenters who were who are focused on this issue. Um, ultimately, that that request was was withdrawn because of I think the community opposition. Um, and I'm happy to share with with county supervisors or RCPA staff around some of the conversations we were having at Permit Sonoma at that time. Um, because I do think, as Director Lamon mentioned, there are some unique rural issues. Honestly, I think the biggest challenge is that most gas station operators, there's not the economic interest in, the, in their ability to make money in some of those outlying areas, which is why some of our rural um, outlying communities may not have the level of, of gas station service that they need, but it's not, uh, I don't see those, those economic um, you know, factors really changing. As you guys mentioned, the mom and pops are no longer really in the game. And these large chains, they go in, they analyze the number of cars, the number, you know, the amount of traffic, and if it's going to be, you know, economically viable for them, which in most of our outlying areas, it's not, which is why they don't, you know, seek permits there. So all that said, I, I wholeheartedly support this effort and uh, really appreciate, I think, especially for a town like Healdsburg, where we have limited staff resources, being able to have a model ordinance that we can bring to our to our planning staff and to our city attorney for them to, to review uh, really will be helpful in moving this forward and, and would like to see it advance. Thank you. Thanks, Director Kelly, for your work on the Planning Commission and your offer of information for what is happening in the unincorporated areas. A little, a little more challenging. I think we're ready for a roll call vote, please. Drew? Yeah, I'm ready for the motion from Director Landman. Uh, Director Bagby? Aye. Director Fisher? Yes. Director Judice? Yes. Director Gurney? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Director Landman? Well, I guess there's not a lot of suspense here, but aye. <laughs> <laughs> Director Levis? Aye. Director Rabbit has since left. Vice Chair Rogers? Aye. And Chair Gorin? Aye. Thank you, board, uh, for great informational uh, discussion and passion about uh, one of the front leading issues, but it might be the easiest one to resolve. So uh, that concludes our meeting for today, unless we have, oh, Drew, go ahead. All right, um, I forgot to remind you about public comment on item 4.5. Um, I received an email from someone who wanted to speak. Uh, Stephen Pierce, if you're still on the line. If okay, that's all right great. with you, Chair Gordon. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. And Stephen, I so I'm so sorry I've forgotten about the public on that item. Yeah, and this was for uh, four or five, the board appointment for funding for climate ad hoc. Great. So yeah, so let me get that timer up. 
go. All right, let's see. All righty, Steve Pierce, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew, Chair Gorin, and board members. I'm encouraged that we're starting to talk about financing. We all recognize that it's the key to implementing the strategy as concerning the RCPA. I'm concerned that the sales tax becomes the default funding source since that's what we're used to doing. And it takes concerted effort to find equitable alternatives to regressive sales taxes. Our limited number of RCPA staff members need help with this analysis. There's a critical need for the finance departments in the county and the cities to step, help, step up and help examine more equitable alternatives. Here are some examples of possible funding alternatives. Tariff on bill financing, green bonds, utility users taxes, which exempt care and fairer customers, increasing property transfer taxes, which applies to Santa Rosa and Petaluma, or adopting new transfer taxes, which applies to all the other cities, as this requires those cities to become a charter city from their current general law city status or adopting local income taxes on high income individuals like the city of Portland has done for homeless services and preschool for all. San Francisco has also adopted business license taxes targeted at high income earners. Portland is seriously examining a local carbon tax on high emitters over 2,500 metric tons of GHG per year. If we end up with sales tax funding, it's my hope that this revenue helps build the bridge to more equitable funding sources. Thank you. Hi. And, oh, and, and thank, thank you so much, Drew. I really appreciate your reminder there. I, I have another one. I have okay. another commenter on this um, as right. well uh, from Jake McKenzie. Jake, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes, I had raised my hand to comment on the same item that the previous speaker had mentioned. Um, I think as the ad hoc committee goes about their task, it may be a statement of the obvious, but the, uh, the legislation which uh, created RCPA back in the day, and I had the uh, distinct pleasure of being the our CPA, uh, what we found was that while we were created as a organization, as an authority representing the nine cities and the county, uh, there were no, fin no financing mechanisms built into that legislation. And uh, I liked the thoughtful comments of the previous speaker in terms of examining uh, other alternative sources other than uh, sales tax. So, um, I just uh, support support his remarks and support a good a good and deep examination of the enabling legislation. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Jake. Chair Gorn, that, that <clears throat> concludes public comment on item four point five. Thank you, and thank you both to the public commenters, and a, a special thank you to you, Jake. We're glad that you're still paying attention, even though you're no longer one of our directors. So, um, Suzanne, there are a number of reports and announcements um, at the end of our agenda. Is there, we used to go through all of them, and we're running short of time. So is there something that you would like to highlight? Uh, there is uh, uh, Chair Gorin. We uh, Chris Cohen is here to do the RCPA activities report with a focus on uh, the water upgrade save program. And so she, if she could do that, we will uh, skip the remaining and the reports are uh, in your packet. Great. Thanks so much. And Chris, welcome. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to report uh, that the city of Sebastopol's water upgrade safe program is off to a rip roaring start. As of uh, last Friday, the program had engaged 67 single family water customers, installed 18 projects, 
scheduled 11 projects and have uh, 24 potential customers in the pipeline. Uh, during the free assessment that customers receive, they also fill out a brief survey. And the reasons given for their interest in the program are water conservation, lower utility bills, and combating the drought. The numbers, uh, I believe there's a slide. Um, if we don't get that slide up here, um, we have a very excellent dashboard that we will be able to report out to you on uh, each month from our program. And uh, the numbers are pretty impressive. The first marketing campaign involved a uh, letter, uh, a letter to customers from the uh, utility. Um, which resulted in uh, this very good initial turnout that we have. We have a second mailing going out uh, this week. Uh, in addition, we're working with two multifamily properties that represent 234 units. So we're working with them to bring them into the program. Uh, there's also very keen interest in the outdoor up upgrade package, which we will be launching in early fall. And finally, we are in conversations with the city of Cloverdale, which is currently reviewing the master agreement for joining the program. Uh, with Windsor, we met with uh, members of the Petaluma Climate Action Commission, and we're also uh, talking with the East Bay Municipal Utilities District. And finally, on the greenhouse gas question, I just want to remind everybody, saving a gallon of water saves electricity and natural gas. Uh, pumping, treating, and heating water represents 20% of electricity and 30% of consumer natural gas use in California. So there's a huge GHG benefit to saving water in addition to the drought that we face. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. As always, I will really appreciate the information from you. And yay, uh, Sebastopol, go for it. Um, so thank you so much for all of the great reports included in our agenda. And just to note, I was looking through the Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, where we have many, many organizations meeting monthly with SCTA, RCPA, but there are a couple of organizations that have never attended that meeting. And it, I'm wondering if it would be good uh, for you to send a little note to a couple of them. Do they want to continue receiving information? Would they rather be dropped uh, from the list of participating organizations? Just a, little, just a reminder that good information and there's no one from your organization uh, zooming in with the advisory committee. So that'd be great. Will do. Okay, thank you all. Great meeting, great provocative discussions. And I really wanna wish you a good evening, a good month, and I will see you next month. Thank you so much. Thank you. But first, um, Director Gurney has her hand up. Director Gurney, quickly. I'm sorry to do this every time, but you forget announcements. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I'm going to cover for Tanya because I wanted to thank her for her help with our planning director and our climate action committee for successfully applying for a Civic Spark Fellow to work with our uh, climate action committee. Tanya, I got the blurb in for you. Thank you. Okay, that was quick and profound and announcements. Yes, thank you. I always forget the announcements. Are there any other announcements? Bite your tongues. <laughs> okay, now. Have a good night. <laughs>